and we're live. Great. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call the February 22nd, 2022 Longmont City Council regular session to order. These meetings are being held remotely due to the ongoing novel coronavirus pandemic. To view the live stream, go to longmontcolorado.gov forward slash agendas, or you can watch it on the city's YouTube channel. Also, longmontpublicmedia.org or Comcast channels 8 or 880. Could we please start with the roll call, Don? Absolutely. Mayor Peck? Here. Councilmember Doggo Faring? Here. Councilmember Martin? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez? Here. Councilmember Waters? Here. Councilmember Yarbrough? Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. Thank you. Let's start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, I'll start us off. I pledge allegiance, allegiance. To, the flag to the flag of the United, the United, United States, States of America, America. America. And, and to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, for which it stands one nation, one nation God, under God, indivisible, indivisible, indivisible with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you. As a reminder to the public, anyone wishing to provide public comment during the public invited to be heard must watch the live stream of the meeting and call in only when I open the meeting for public comment. Callers are not able to access the meeting at any other time. Anyone wishing to provide comment on second reading or public hearing items should call in at that time and not during first call public invited to be heard. Anyone calling during first call public invited to be heard? No, I'm sorry. With comments about second reading or public hearing items will be asked to call back in when second reading and public hearings are announced. To call in, look at, the, at your screen. The toll-free call-in number is there. It is 888-788-0091. Watch for the instructions to be displayed and write down the meeting ID when it's displayed at the very beginning of the meeting. Wait for me to open public comment and direct callers to call in. When I say to call in, dial the toll-free number, enter the meeting ID, and when it asks for your participant ID, press the pound sign. Please mute the live stream and listen for instructions on the phone. Callers will be called upon by the last three digits of their phone number, and comments are limited to three minutes per person. Each speaker must state their name and address for the record prior to proceeding with their comments. Once done speaking, simply hang up. Uh, we don't have any minutes to approve tonight. So we're going directly to uh, motions to direct the city manager to add agenda items to future agendas. Do any counselors have any agenda items they would like to add? Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor Peck. Um, first, I'd like to start off with a, a little bit of a, a status update, and then I'll possibly be making uh, some motions. So on the October 5th, 2021 agenda meeting, that's where we spoke about um, updates to inclusionary housing ordinance, as well as some other amendments as far as the land development code is, is concerned. Um, so I saw that the inclusionary housing ordinance and related items were supposed to come back in front of us first or second quarter, according to uh, the the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering where we were on that item. Um, IZ's coming end of March, correct, Karen? I'm pretty sure. It's I'm here. I'm here. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so. Um... Yeah, I think, well, we were bringing one of the items back the end of March, March 29th, or it could go into that first um, regular meeting in April. Um, but but that's the uh, that's the next update. Okay, so it I'm is, looking it for is that. on the horizon. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully to be, you know, sooner rather than later, ideally. Uh, a part of that discussion was also design standards, and it was specific to industrial uh, design standards. I was hoping that, uh, and that that said, second quarter uh, in the the uh, the meeting, um, and so I'm hoping to add not just commercial industrial but also residential design standards to that. So I will be making a motion to add 
residential design standards to the conversation in the second quarter uh, as far as industrial and commercial design standards are concerned. That is a motion. Second. Do I have a second? Councillor Hidalgo firing made the second. And so for instance, I just wanna give quickly before we, we make that vote, uh, an example being that I believe in current code, there's something like 30% of a building's facade can be um, steel, for instance. And we understand that came from the fact that older buildings that were corrugated steel are, are kind of ugly. I get that. But there are a lot of new products that are, are steel-based that are not that same corrugated steel look. And so to really, uh, you know, dive deeply into that, not just for commercial industrial, but also for residential. So that's the impetus behind that motion. So, and then I do have one more thing after, after this vote, if there's no discussion. Okay, does anybody else have a comment? Councillor Waters. Yeah, is, uh, I assume Glenn's on the call. I haven't looked at the roster. No, he's not on the call. Glenn's not on the call tonight. Um, well, Harold, can you give us an update or maybe Joni in the, in the body of work, I, I, I'm recalling the conversation and the presentation in October from October as well in the body of work, uh, are, are, are in terms of design standards is what, uh, mayor pro Tim's asking for not included in the work they're doing now. And if we're going to add that, is it delay? Cause we're already, you know, pushing it into the first meeting in the second quarter what was projected for the first quarter, is it gonna create any kind of a delay in, um, in what we're gonna see? So we've got some, I'm gonna let Joni come in. So some design standards that are more in the infrastructure work that I know that uh, Jim and Chris are working on. That came up in the agenda meeting last Thursday. I've talked to Jim, I'm pushing for in March to have a final public, final conversation with the uh, impacted parties and that's more engineers developers on that one and then moving quickly to bring that back to you all I think Aaron's talking about design standards rate right, related to facade construction is that correct Aaron or council member is that uh, not just facade but general building materials as far as trying to figure out ways to open up possibilities for bringing into our portfolio um, newer materials, be it 3D printed materials, things like that, that uh, could bring us some of these uh, products for housing. That's why I wanted to add residential to okay. the already scheduled conversation on industrial commercial, uh, because obviously we understand the housing crunch and crisis. And so that's why I wanted to include that in what was already supposed to be scheduled the second quarter uh, discussion on building standards, design standards, I mean, uh, which could also possibly include some other, some other ideas such as landscaping issues. Councilor Martin. And I could, I get an answer to my question. Oh, I'm Thanks. sorry. I, I thought you got it. Uh, yeah. All right, Joey. So uh, Mayor Peck, Council uh, Member Rodriguez. So I'm looking at Glenn's schedule that he has um, sent forward and we were going to begin the design standards for industrial buildings in the second quarter. So that was a start date for that item. We also have some um, updates for historic east side and west side, um, compatibility updates. We've started looking at those and hope to have those completed by the end of the second quarter. So I think that goes to your comment about residential design standards and adding back in to certain areas of town, <clears throat> some of those. We do have a, a pretty lengthy list of code updates and we also continue to have the steam and sugar mill project moving forward. So um, when Glenn is able to return uh, next week, we can perhaps update the schedule and see what we can do but I don't want to speak out of turn this evening and say that that's exactly where that's tracking today. Well, I just want to say if, if adding to this at this point delays that entire body of work, I'm, I'm going to be concerned about, it. I'd like to know that before I cast a vote on the motion tonight. Councillor Martin. Oh, I'm sorry. Councillor Waters is 
Are you finished with your questions? Yeah, I, I, it sounds like there isn't an answer. So I'm, I'm probably going to vote no on the motion because I don't I'm not going to add to the scope of that work um, and then delay. If it means delaying the schedule and getting to us the things that were proposed or described back in October, that's that's it seems to me that's what we do on Tuesday nights at times. And it's it's what keeps stuff from getting done and back to us. And I just don't want to contribute to that. Councillor Martin. Um, I understand Dr. Waters' concern very much um, as I am frustrated with the slippage rate that we're experiencing, even though I understand why it's happening. And yet, um, maybe it's a matter of reprioritization, like not so much looking at facade standards, but rather core building material standards, because we do have a sense of urgency in terms of getting uh, building stock, whether it's housing or industrial stock, out of the ground. And we do have a problem where uh, you know, it's predicted that the, that the supply of lumber, our standard, most standard building material is going to be constrained for years. Um, but we have new, you know, 3D printed metallic uh, structural design materials coming up and, and, and again, using those for 3D printed uh, uh, buildings and manufactured buildings. And if we, you know, we don't want to find that there are code barriers uh, to using that stuff. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure whether uh, the mayor pro tem would like to revise his his motion so that it leaves the the staff um, more more leeway in terms of reprioritizing, but getting the most important materials revisions to us early so that uh, we can work on it. But um, I just I just feel that it is so important that it needs consideration. Thank you. Um, is, are there any other comments? Um, Mayor Pro Tem, I mean, yes, I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Uh, as to uh, revising uh, the, the motion, I guess in a certain way, I thought that would be utilizing the current direction and just adding on to it. But if it, it really needs the reprioritization to say that we need to evaluate residential before we res before we evaluate industrial commercial. I'm happy to take that amendment uh, because the second or the, the next thing I want to talk about is also reprioritization. And so it, it kind of fits into where I think we are at a, as a, a crisis or a crux point um, in, in talking about this, because the other thing I want to talk about is, is secondary uses. But first, I, I will say I, if Councilmember Martin is proposing, it, you know, a friendly amendment, if you will, to my motion, or if you'd just like me to uh, rephrase my motion, I, I would like that opportunity. You know, I'm going to vote for what you moved anyway for considering the new material options that we have in some form as early as possible. Um, so, however you phrase it, is is pretty much fine with me, but I just wanted to express my concurrence with your sense of urgency. And, um, you know, we've, we've had two years of being frustrated by code not matching our objectives. And I don't want to be taking in new technology for building things faster and then be stymied by um, code that doesn't match once again. So do what you think. So do you think you should? Thank you. So in essence, you know, I was adding it to what was already supposed to be scheduled discussion of this uh, as far as, as design standards are concerned for industrial and commercial use and adding residential to it. But I would like to prioritize residential uh, when we talk about it because we're facing more of that crunch than we are uh, industrial commercial crunch as far as design standards and unsafe facade features. Um, and so that I would amend my motion to prioritize residential in the conversation scheduled for approximately the second quarter for design standards. I, uh, so you're gonna second his um, new motion. So are you taking your 
first motion off the table. Mayor Pro Tem, is this a new one? I was just amending the motion, but okay. we can. Okay, this sounds good. Um, uh, what I the way I interpreted the the motion was basically listening to the conversation we've had over the past two years during uh, COVID that our codes are not they're not up to date. They're not usable. We've got we've got developers in the queue. So for me, the motion was about let's let's amend the code to help developers get products that are faster, easier, and and help get our housing stock and move these move these. Um, I'm sorry, these uh, developers through the queue if that's possible faster. Uh, for me, to be quite honest, I love the STEAM project. I think it's great, but I feel that this IZO and our housing crunch should, at, at this point, getting those amendments in, getting the codes changed or amended uh, is a priority. If we are actually going to work with developers to, uh, to make it workable. So um, th that's just, it's not a motion or anything. It's just uh, an opinion to the planning department that I think that the housing crunch is a priority over STEAM. I know we're gonna work on it all the time, but that's the way I would like it prioritized. So um, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Um, let's take a vote. Um, I was just listening. So Mayor Pro Tem, you want to restate your motion? Yes, I, I move to prioritize residential design standards uh, conversation before industrial commercial design standards conversation, which is scheduled sometime in the second quarter, according to the October 5th, 2021 meeting. Great, thank you. And that has been seconded by Council Councilor Martin. All those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed? So that passes with uh, Councillor Waters in opposition. Um, Mayor- One Pro more Tim. thing, yes. Okay, uh, go ahead. Uh, and this, this relates to uh, a lot of the consternation that I think we've heard uh, from Planning and Zoning Commission as well as some, some members of our, our, you know, some of our residents as far as the Rivertown Annex that we put forward and approved. And that was the concept of condition, conditional uses or secondary uses. And that was mentioned also in the October 5th, 2021 meeting uh, as date to be determined to have that discussion. I would like that prioritized up a little further to maybe second or third quarter, at least a date certain uh, in concept, maybe not directly a date certain, but a second or third quarter concept as a reprioritization, because I feel that it's likely we'll see more of these as more annexations are considered, uh, not just along the river, but uh, in some other mixed use development areas where folks such as uh, the sugar mill area, where um, some mixed use opportunities might be utilized more for multifamily residential, which is technically in some mixed use cases, uh, a secondary use or uh, a conditional use. And so I just would like to maybe move that up in the priority list to second or third quarter to address that before we continue to get um, arguments based on the fact that it is a conditional or secondary use, just so we can make things very clear for the public as well as for each other and for the Planning and Zoning Commission. So, so that's you, that's my motion. Your motion is to move the primary and secondary use discussion uh, up a, to the second or third quarter. A secondary or conditional use discussion, which was only to be, to be determined at the time to second or third quarter, depending okay. on staff availability. Um, do we have a second for that? I'll second it, and, and uh, the reason that I will is that when I read the annexation for the aggregate concrete uh, parcel, I saw the frustration in the planners in, uh, in their discussion that they didn't really know what primary and secondary uses were. And I'd also talked to staff who said, cities, other cities don't do this. They just have uses. They don't have primary and secondary. So um, I think this is a discussion we do need to have to uh, Mayor Pro Tim's point that we're going to have more annexations and it needs to be made pretty clear for the 
uh, planning uh, and zoning board as to what they're voting on and what they're discussing. Councillor Martin. Uh, yeah, I would just like to say in support of the planners, um, I thought that the definition that was given was clear and um, useful, although perhaps um, not that accessible to the public. So uh, what I would like to say is I, I would vote to you know, get that clarified. Um, I hope that we can um, minimize the amount of effort to um, you know, uh, a clearer statement of what we already have rather than a redesign. Um, but, but again, that I'm just commenting on it and, and again, trying to respect the amount of work that the planning staff has to do in parallel. Um, I just wanna say that in my mind, the existing definition is workable, implementable, maybe needs to be stated more clearly. Or maybe we just don't need to try to dance so many angels on the head of the same pin. Are there any other comments from council? So this is a motion by uh, Councillor Yarbrough. Yes, so I guess I kind of wanted to know, uh, I, I, maybe I'm, I'm just trying to make sure I understand. We are trying to, um, make sure that the definition is, is stated better for the community so they can understand more or and have planning and development to make sure that it's more transparent. Is that what, is that what you're asking, uh, Mayor Pro Tem? Yes, so uh, I, I believe it's stated that, for instance, with the Rivertown Annex, that that particular mixed use zoning allows for a high density residential as a conditional use um, or secondary use maybe. Possibly. Uh, the point being is that there is debate amongst planning and zoning commission. Uh, it sounds like there was some debate amongst staff. And I know that there was some debate amongst council members as we, as we um, you know, deliberated upon the annexation itself. And so I think clarity is necessary, especially as we're likely to get more of these uh, possible annexations or possible mixed use developments uh, proposed in front of us. And so at least to allow uh, potential developers to allow the Planning and Zoning Commission to understand at least our thought process as the City Council when they're making their deliberations is, I think, a prudent uh, path forward uh, as far as the decision-making process is concerned. Because if, if we have clearly delineated one way or another what we think, it'll at least allow the process to work in a way uh, that there's no confusion. And that's the probably most efficient and effective way to move forward in any of these things. So the residents, you know, our, 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 our constituents all know, the, the business community knows, uh, our boards and commissions know. It's just providing clarity provides efficiency. And that, that's where I was going. And also not, like I said, to uh, necessarily laden the, uh, the staff with too much extra work. That's why I said second or third quarter, depending on the the uh, the workload of the staff, as already mentioned. Uh, Harold, the, the way I under if I can help bring, I need some clarity. I think what I heard was the item that we had set to discuss that had a TBA. Uh, Council Member Rodriguez wanted to see if we could schedule that in the third quarter or second quarter, um, but also based on availability with the other items. And that would give us a chance to kind of look at what we structure and things that aren't as important to council, we can slide down. Uh, I mean, there's, everything's important, but things that aren't as urgent, we can look at the schedule and adjust it. That's the way I understood the motion. Is that correct? Yes, for clarification, there was, I think, four, four other items that were all TBD from that meeting that we had talked about. And so sliding that one to the top of those four or five TBDs would be uh, basically what I'm getting at. Okay. Uh, Councillor Hidalgo Faring? No, I didn't have my hand up. Oh, you didn't. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, 
just to move a little bit uh, for clarity, I also think that if we get this clarified for the Planning and Zoning Commission, it will um, help us not set a precedent over one development over the other because we would be using the same standards for each development, each annexation, and not have it be interpreted differently every time it needs to be used. And I and I what that that's what I want is that they know exactly how it's to be used and it's not really going to be super flexible depending upon what what development it is, that there's not a precedent set. Um, does that make sense, Councillor Waters? Uh, what you just said makes sense to me. Um, if that was if that was a question to which you wanted a response. Um, uh, I appreciate Mayor Pro Tem's uh, concern about staff load. I, obviously, I'm concerned about that as well. Is there any, Harold or Joni, since Glenn's on the call, um, those, those four items were left. If we, now, if we, if we start to put those onto a calendar, I, I, it would be helpful to know what slips back, right? If, if anything, or what doesn't get done, if anything, if we now say by the end of the second quarter or third quarter, uh, put that on the on a, the uh, in the queue on the calendar. Anything that slips, anything that doesn't get done, or just tell us what isn't going to get done, or what's going to get delayed because we move something else up. I think when when Glenn gets back, um, if Council does this, we can come back and and give you that. Okay, if we move this one up here, it's going to look like this, and here's what's going to happen, and that's that's our deliverable to you. So I'll, I'll say again, I, I'm sympathetic. I appreciate the, the interest in getting this done. I just, it's frustrating to be voting and not knowing what the implications are for work that has already been scheduled and um, either gets delayed or doesn't get done because we've added something else. Not that the something else wasn't going to be added at some point. I just, it's, it's voting without all the information I'd sure like to have. So... I would like, let me, I'm, I'm thinking this through. Um, I agree with you, Councillor Waters. Um, and I'm also concerned about some work that's being done that a third party is waiting for an answer on. And if it, if it is again slipped back at the bottom of the queue again, that would be a problem. So um, would it be a better, a, a better uh, motion to say that we would like a, a list of priorities and which how they can be juggled from Glenn according to the, the schedule um, before we make a motion for date certain. Um, is that making any sense at all? That would be helpful to me. And I, yeah, and I would like to, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, what, well, the, the basis of that motion was uh, to prioritize it over other TBD items, not okay. ones that had already had dates certain. Okay, uh, that's much more so clear. Okay. That was, that was the concept of it. Uh, okay. Because to me, when they all say to, to be determined, uh, I have no reasonable way of knowing where anybody's at on that as far as staff uh, is concerned. Uh, that's why I did not try to prioritize it over other items, such as the uh, compatibility uh, for east and, and west side historic neighborhoods, for instance, that had a date certain on it. So I didn't try to prioritize it above that in the motion. So that, that was why I phrased it the way I did. Okay, thanks. That's much more clear to me. So uh, we have a, a motion by... Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez for the primary and secondary conditional uses uh, to be prioritized above the TBD um, items on Glenn's prior list, planning list. And I didn't say it the way he did, but I'm trying to make it clear to myself. And I seconded that motion. Um, all those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, Mayor Pro Tem, was that your last motion? 
Okay. Um, I have, I'm not even, I'm not, cons I'm not so sure this is, a, it is an emotion, but it is a direction. And um, I'm going to do it at this part of the agenda because it makes sense. I have been, or several people have been um, contacted by residents of Firestone because there is a huge, uh, I'm trying to pull it up here. There is a huge oil and gas development going in and it's very close to the um, saddle, saddle back golf course. It's 33 wells that have been in front of, in front of the uh, Colorado um, gas, GOCCC. And they pushed back the hearing gate because they've had so much input from the public. And I would like to uh, have a voice in that because it is too close to um, houses. It's, it's almost on the airport. If you Google it, it looks like two of the wells are right on the green, the end of the greenway. Um, COGCC is giving, they're not really following SB 181 to the letter of the law. And there is a point in SB 181 that I wanna to read to you, if you give me a minute. Um, it is section 25-7-128. And it says that um, this subsection is, uh, is not to minimize the adverse impacts to public health, safety, and welfare and the environment. Nothing in this subsection is intended to alter, expand, or diminish the authority of local governments, which we are, to regulate air quality under section 25.7.128. For purposes of this subsection, minimize adverse impacts means to the extent necessary and reasonable to pr protect public health, safety, and welfare, and the environment by avoiding adverse impacts from oil and gas operations. What I would like to direct staff to do, um, because I think it's very important that we help our regional communities when they are asking for help in, in in anything that is going to impact the health, safety, and welfare, not only of their municipality, but of the region. I, so what I would like to do is uh, make a motion to direct staff to become, um, let me pull up my motion, to write COGCC as a, a concerned party citing the adverse impacts statement in SB 181, section 25.7.128 to Longmont using our boulder.com, boulderair.com data that we are gathering constantly. Uh, we have tons of data showing the impact to our air, to the uh, environment, um, to everything. And this statement in SB 181 is specific to the adverse impacts to other municipalities and local governments. So I would like to make the motion, this is, this is in no way um, joining a lawsuit or anything. It's nothing more than saying to COGCC, do your job, that this is too close, too close to houses, too close to the airport. I mean, I'm sorry, the golf course, too close to Longmont. It is on, uh, where is this? It's on County Road 20 and Colorado Boulevard. If you know Firestone at all, you know where Colorado Boulevard is in uh, County Road 20. So they're having their last hearing on March 10th. So uh, that's the motion I wanna make that they um, write as as concerned party, as Longmont as a concerned party, citing SB 181. Councilor Yarbrough. Um, I appreciate um, Mayor Peck, all that, you know, what you're saying. What I would like to hear from um, City Attorney uh, Eugene May to find out if, just to make sure that that's feasible, if we can do that. And I I'm sure we, we want to support but I just want to make sure that um, I, I would like to hear from him 
So okay, make sure good. we're not sticking our feet into something that may get us in trouble later. <laughs> good point. Uh, Eugene? Uh, Mayor and Council, Eugene May, City Attorney. Uh, I, I have to say, I, I don't know what that development is. I focused on areas and development inside uh, Longmont's right. borders, but we can certainly comment to the COGCC. Um, you know, I don't think that would risk any oil and gas development issues in Longmont if we just comment as a concerned party. It's basically a, a testimony at when, when you testify at the hearing um, as that uh, since we have the data, which is why we're collecting it to begin with, um, as what it's doing to our air quality. And we've all heard and read the statements in, in the newspapers and other air quality monitoring stations about how bad the air quality is in our area. <laughs> um, so anything, it doesn't matter. Um, and the air quality that we are gathering, the air quality monitoring is also coming from the cement plant. It's, it's basically saying, please don't add anything else to, um, to make our air quality worse than it is um, as we are trying to clean it up um, and pay attention to what the law says, which is SB 181 about the health, safety, and welfare of uh, residents. Uh, Councilor Hidalgo Faring. So um, I do have a point of order for us to continue with discussion. Um, don't you need a second? Oh, thank you. I'll second it. <laughs> so we Thank can you. And now you can make your comment. Um, yes. So, um, you know, I get, I wanted to hear at, um, you know, so we're writing the letter to COGCC and then all I see on there is uh, as a concerned party, but what, um, you know, in reference to following Senate Bill um, 181 legislation and what other, you um, component, because I also heard you mention something about including the data from our air quality. Yes, and that would just be to prove the point that the air quality is being affected by uh, oil and gas uh, operations, mm -hmm. um, as well as other other things, the fire, the, mm -hmm. so um, pay attention, yes. follow the law, no, and I, I agree. Um, I think one of the most disturbing um, pieces of information that I learned um, was that how where um, geographically where Longmont sits or Boulder County where we sit, we are kind of like a, a pit that collects that, um, you know, that polluted air. And it's, and I, I mean, I see it, you know, anecdotally, I see it with my son every time he has an asthma attack. It's like I jump on and see what um, what the air quality is, and it is low. It is, I mean, I'm sorry, um, the numbers for um, was it the methane and um, benzene? Benzene right. was the one that was really affecting him. So we just, we, you know, I mean, we collect this polluted air. So we, you know, I think it's very appropriate that we do state our concerns. So I, I, I will yeah. be supporting this. That's all it is, is holding, holding their feet to the letter of the law, which is SB 181. Mm -hmm. So um, do we have any other comments? Uh, Mayor Pro Tim Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mayor Peck. Uh, so I would say that based on the fact that this really isn't gonna cost us, you know, uh, special council time, uh, things like that. Also in the fact that, uh, because of our charter and the fracking ban within our charter, uh, to a certain extent, and, until that gets maybe pulled out of the charter by a vote, we, to a certain extent, have a mandate to voice our opinion about any oil and gas development that's done that affects the city of Longmont and the residents of Longmont. And so based on the assumption that it will, it will be very limited as far as cost, uh, to voice our opinion as a, you know, body testifying about a potential impact to our municipality, I would support this motion. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Martin. 
Yeah, I'd just like to point out that it was not many years ago that we, uh, in fact, voted a resolution of support for SB 181. Um, and so we're being completely consistent in, in uh, expressing our deep desire that it be enforced as written. Thank you. And uh, as far as uh, staff time, you know, Janie Turner has been collecting this data for almost two years, so it wouldn't be hard at all for her to pull it all together and throw it in a letter before the hearing on March 10th. So is, is there any more discussion? Uh, so the uh, I made the motion to direct staff to write this letter to COGCC as a concerned party citing the adverse impacts statement per SB 181, and it was seconded by Councillor Hidalgo Faring. All those in favor, raise your hand. Thank you, all those opposed. That passes unanimously. Thank you very much. It's very important to me and hopefully to all of us. So uh, we are now at the uh, point, just let me grab this, I got this all mixed up again, um, of public invited to be heard. I think we have a presentation on the on the agenda. We do. Uh, and thank you, very, sir. It's uh, the Longmont Public Media update. No, first we need to go back to the city manager's report. Harold, do you have a report for us tonight? Um, no, Mayor, other than um, we're still above the, um, we're not getting the same presentations we used to, but we're still above the high transmission rate, but we're continuing to, to dive down. And okay. we will know when we hit that point. Okay, thank you. So now we do have the special report. Thank you, Councillor Waters, for that uh, re reminder. Uh, I would like Sergio Angeles to come up. He's the Executive Director and General Manager of Longmont Public Media, and he has a presentation for us. Sergio, are you here? I am, yeah. Hello. Hey, good <laughs> evening. <laughs> uh, yeah, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. As uh, Mayor Peck mentioned, uh, my name is Sergio Angelis. I'm the Executive Director and General Manager of Lama Public Media, and I'm here to give you all an update about what we've been up to in 2021. Uh, so if Dallas, if you could put the presentation up and go to the next slide, please. So Longmont Public Media, or LPM for short, is Longmont's media makerspace and public access TV station. Next slide. As a 501c3 nonprofit, our mission is to educate, produce, and to distribute local media. Next slide. And we do this by providing a media makerspace to our community to teach media creation, to produce, and to distribute local content. Next slide. So the agenda for tonight will be to just briefly go over the 2021 scope of services and then discuss our accomplishments last year to provide metrics and viewership, um, to excuse me, to provide metrics on viewership and membership, as well as to discuss opportunities and challenges and risks moving forward. Next slide. So what you see here on the screen is uh, just part of the scope of services. I won't go over all of it, um, I'll just highlight certain things. Uh, I'll start off with uh, part of our scope was to broadcast quality programming on the current Comcast uh, cable channel eight, which is standard definition, 880, which is HD, uh, YouTube, Roku, and on our own website, as well as to broadcast only generated content on channels 14 and 16. It was also to produce a variety of different programming and live streamed events from city council meetings, PNZ meetings, sports, art, history, and entertainment programs, how-to classes such as cooking and painting classes, other types of performing arts programs, uh, videos created by the City of Longmont staff submitted to LPM for distribution, uh, recording all the boards and commissions, and then uh, converting those uh, via AI voice-to-text software into searchable text, as well as having an open to the public podcast studio and a live streaming radio station also to uh, produce uh, up to 20 hours a week of videography time uh, that is at the discretion of city staff. Next slide. Additionally, it was to do a whole bunch of uh, community outreach uh, to coordinate a public access program, train residents on how to use publicly owned equipment, 
as well as work with other local outlets and organizations to produce innovative programming. Um, it was to develop an ongoing marketing plan, as well as to capture and then share those metrics to all of you and to the community. Next slide. So in 2021, we of course maintain and broadcast channel eight and 880 in 2021 with minimal downtime. We did begin broadcasting channel 14, which is education and channel 16, which is the government channel to Comcast, our website and Roku. So as of the summer of last year, we are now running all three public access channels and they originate out of Lama Public Media, all running independent programming. We of course continue to broadcast city council like we are tonight and planning and zoning live. Of course, we continue to record, transcribe and broadcast all of the boards and commissions when they were held in person and when they are not obviously due to COVID. Um, once those were uh, sent over to us, we did process those for transcription and post, post those up on our website. And we did continue to operate a streaming radio station. Next slide. We also, as I mentioned, operate a membership-based media makerspace. So we are open to the public 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday with free access to studios, video editing software and hardware, video equipment such as cameras, mics, mixers, lights, and of course, an open to the public podcasting studio. In 2021, our public membership increased by 157%. And at the end of the year, we had 201 members. Additionally, in October of last year, we did join Boulder County Public Health uh, Vaccine Verified Facilities Program. Next slide. We continue to provide videography services of up to 20 hours per week to the city of Longmont. Uh, last year, every Monday, we uh, LPM staff along with uh, city staff met to discuss upcoming projects, as well as work on you know, other projects, uh, edits, et cetera. We hosted several events such as member content screenings, uh, weekly member meetings, sound post sessions, and movie nights. We also started uh, working on creating an audio studio that will be open to the public based on feedback that we received. And we, of course, taught a variety of different classes. Next slide. Some of those classes include, but not limited to, Premiere Pro 101, how to live stream on Zoom, intro to YouTube Shorts, live streaming on Facebook, live streaming on YouTube, Lights, Camera, Write, which is a screenwriting 101 class. Next slide. We also taught uh, and hosted a Premiere Pro Editing Club, Amiibo Start 101 class, uh, video post-production and an intro to editing with Adobe Premiere, as well as a bunch of other video production classes from A10 101, VMix 101, and also started doing a photo printing class online. So all of these classes were uh, just focused obviously on the technology, on the equipment, on hardware. Um, and those were taught either by staff or other members um, that also know how to use that hardware or software to other members of the public. Next slide. Uh, continuing with our accomplishments, we also launched an equipment rental system. So residents can now rent and check out video, audio, and photography equipment directly from Longmont Public Media. And as a paying LPM member, you do get free equipment rental to use anywhere you'd like. We currently have three full-time employees, including myself and one part-time employee. We cover 99% of health insurance. We offer flexible PTO and a 401k. And more importantly, we are the go-to destination for Longmont-specific content, either on Facebook, on our YouTube channel, and on our Roku app. Next slide. So now I wanna talk a little bit about our makerspace. Uh, we did make a bunch of changes last year. Um, so just want you guys to see some of what we've done. Um, so what you see here, uh, this is our podcasting room, uh, supports up to four people. We spruced it up with some paint as well as put in some audio panels. So it sounds amazing. Uh, we have this really easy to use Rodecaster Pro. So all you really need to do is come in and hit record and you have an amazing sounding podcast. We do have a video uh, and several other video classes on, on equipment like this. Uh, when we, We've had a bunch of different people uh, come in, create podcasts, or use the room uh, for voiceovers. Um, the Longmont Public Library actually uses the podcast studio here for their podcast book chatter. Next slide. 
In addition to it being a podcast room, uh, it can also serve as a set. So these are three uh, local high school students that produce their own TV show called TechPad, and they use the room uh, as a set. Next slide. This is uh, our largest studio, which is in the upstairs part of the building. Uh, completely opened it up. We added a white vinyl uh, roll for more professional shoots, black and white curtains, an extensive lighting grid, um, and just made it very flexible for content creators uh, to come in and use the space, uh, really depending on whatever they're wanting it uh, for. Um, and I'll show a little bit later on uh, some examples of what those sets look like. Next slide. As I mentioned, we also uh, have a whole bunch of equipment. Uh, so this is our equipment room. Uh, pretty much anything you can think of, we have from iPads and uh, studio lights, teleprompters, um, shoulder, shoulder rigs for cameras, TVs, camcorders, uh, wireless microphones. Um, as I said, you name it, we probably have it. And all of this is available for people to come in and use or also rent and use outside of LPN. Next slide. We also have an editing room with one, uh, one Mac and two PCs that come fully loaded with all the video editing software from Premiere Pro, uh, DaVinci Resolve with a speed editing keyboard, uh, Final Cut Pro, iMovie. And more recently, we did acquire two printers there. Uh, so if anyone is interested in photography, we do teach a class on how to use that so that you can print your own prints. Next slide. Uh, so now I want to talk a little bit about the programming that we broadcast last year. Next slide. So on channel 8, 880, 14, and 16, we do distribute and broadcast uh, state, national, and global content, such as uh, content from Colorado Parks and Wildlife from the Denver Zoo. Uh, excuse me, CDOT actually uh, reached out to us about broadcasting their new WinterWise campaign. Uh, we continue to broadcast Democracy Now! Monday through Friday. And as you know, our sister city with Chino, Japan. Uh, so we have the U.S. consulate here in uh, of Japan in Denver send us um, Japan video topics of a variety of different videos about that. Next slide. But more importantly, I really want to highlight just the wide variety and diversity of local programming across all three of these public access channels. I don't want to go through all of them, uh, but I do want to highlight um, some, some for you all. Um, so of course, continuing with city council, uh, PNZ, boards and commissions, uh, Kafuut Council, those are held virtually. Um, all the Longmont Museum, Thursday night, the museum shows and the summer concert series, all broadcast and produced uh, remotely. Of course, the sister city is a Northern Arapaho signing ceremony. Uh, we did produce Lamont Startup Week 2021. That was live for five days of six hours of content uh, per day. Uh, the Lamont City Council 2021 candidate videos and debates, both in English and Spanish. Boulder County Tonight, which was a late night show uh, created by Andy Epler. And Andy also uh, put on a, an election night special report. Uh, we continue to get uh, weather for weekly weather forecasts from local meteorologist John Ensworth. And he continues to do a monthly uh, astronomy show called Skies Over Colorado. Um, a new show called Proper Tea Time with local realtor Sarah Morrow is a really awesome show all about the local realtor market um, and information to people wanting to purchase homes. Abbott and Wallace, a local distillery, did an incredible holiday series about how to mix cocktails, um, which is really fun to watch. Um, anytime we get a new piece of gear, uh, we produce a video called LPM Unboxing, so viewers and residents can know what the equipment is and how to use it. Uh, the Sound Post Sessions, which is an intimate concert experience um, held at LPM, uh, which is recorded and then later broadcast at a later date. Uh, Humans of Longmont, which is a new show about getting to know our residents better. Loco in Love, which is a local dating show uh, to help Longmont residents find love if you're single. Uh, a cooking show, uh, The Backstory with Tim Waters, uh, Mooka Moment, a kids yoga and mindfulness show. Um, What's in Our Air, which was a three-part series uh, submitted to us by the Longmont climate community. Um, TechPad, a local technology show. Um, and as you can see, just a whole bunch of <laughs> local content. Uh, there is a bunch more that 
I didn't put on here from music videos, uh, locally produced music videos to people going on, on a hike and climbing Long's Peak, and then we broadcast it. Um, so just a lot of uh, diversity in our local programming. Next slide. So now I just want to show a little, uh, some behind the scenes of some other stuff here at, at, at the studio. So this was uh, the Longmont EDP Economic Summit of what the set looked like in 2021. Uh, we will also be producing the 2022 summit, which is on Thursday. Next slide. This is uh, the behind the scenes of Longmont Startup Week 2021. Uh, we had three different sets that we swapped out throughout the week. Next slide. Uh, this is Crystal. She is a shop captain at Tinker Mill, and every month she holds a shop talk uh, where you can learn about the latest jewelry making techniques. Uh, so we live streamed one of them one month last year. Next slide. As I mentioned, uh, we host the sound post sessions at Lama Public Media. Uh, this is run and produced by Tim Goldsrud. Um, they're at the studio and it, it turns the room into an intimate 40 person concert, uh, which sounds beautiful. Uh, and you really just get to experience the music. We do record it and then we broadcast it later um, on all the public access channels as well as video on demand. And more recently, we also convert that into a podcast so people can listen to it. Next slide. This was a, a GIF about uh, of the sample sessions of just some of the footage that we captured that night. Obviously, it's a much better quality if you watch it online, just a compressed GIF. Next slide. This is a behind the scenes of uh, Andy Upler's late night show, Boulder County Tonight. Next slide. And another photo of Andy uh, during his Boulder County election special. Next slide. As I mentioned, uh, we did a cooking show. So we partnered with the Times Collaborative. They have an amazing test kitchen in the back. Um, so we, uh, a couple members uh, went and produced and recorded uh, this cooking show and just had a lot of fun as well as ate some really delicious food. Next slide. This is a behind the, set, uh, behind the scenes set of Proper Tea Time, the local realtor show with Sarah Morrow. Next slide. We also hosted a wide variety of different movie nights uh, where we would watch movies of different genres and then talk about them afterward. Next slide. We also held member screenings. So whenever members completed content, we would hold like a, a little celebration uh, to just uh, to see what they've accomplished and to just celebrate uh, just the content that they've created. Next slide. More recently, we also uh, started doing film screenings and fundraising events. So Brian Hedden here is a local filmmaker uh, producing Fracking the System, which is a feature documentary on Colorado's oil and gas wars. Next slide. And last but not least, uh, LPM staff alongside Sister Cities and uh, City of Lamont staff traveled up to the Northern Arapaho a tribe in Wyoming and uh, recorded a lot of footage, did a lot of interviews for a documentary that will be released later this year. Next slide. So now I want to talk about metrics. Next slide. So in 2021, uh, 1,094,617 minutes of content was watched on Lama Public Media. So all this data is from our YouTube channel, our Facebook page, Vimeo, Roku, and our website. What isn't included in here is viewership from Comcast, as Comcast has told us that they don't have metrics on that. Um, also not included on here is City of Lamont viewership and data from any videos that we produce for the city. Next slide. So in 2021, we had 31,166 total viewers, so about a third of the city reaching total impressions, meaning the number of times that content was displayed to people of 641,616 times. The average percentage viewed is a little bit under 13%, and the average view duration is five minutes and 26 seconds. So I do want to note that while it may, it may seem low, uh, we do have a wide variety of different content that spans from 30 seconds or a minute long, all the way to three, four plus hours. And that does alter those statistics and metrics. Um, we also ended the year with almost 1600 uh, installs of Lama Public Media's Roku app. Next slide. 
In terms of website metrics, we ended the year with a little over 87,000 page views, almost 20,000 users, and a little bit under 28,000 sessions. Next slide. In terms of the most popular uh, videos or shows watched on Longmont Public Media, not surprisingly, it was the 2021 Longmont City Council mayoral debate, followed by the at-large candidate debate, followed by broadcast script writing 101. This was a class that LPM produced, um, followed by uh, Meet the Candidate Tim Waters, and then our cooking show, Chef Glenn Makes the Best Gumbo and NoCo. Next slide. The least popular videos and shows watch on LPM are a variety of different boards and commission videos, as well as one random weather forecast for the week beginning November 17th. Next slide. Uh, the ranked list of shows based on the total number of likes is our cooking show, followed by Meet the Founders, a local entrepreneur show, local, Loco in Love, our dating show, of course, the mayoral and at-large debates, uh, Meet the Candidates, Boulder County Tonight, Rational Politics, Future We Deserve, The Backstory, Skies Over Colorado, and then MOOCA Moment. Next slide. So the most liked videos, and you might start to see a trend here, uh, is again, our cooking show with number one, followed by, uh, excuse me, broadcast script writing 101, uh, Meet the Founders also with Glenn. Um, our dating show is Shaquille the One for You, um, and uh, the city, uh, city of Longmont Candidate Forum at Large Candidates. Next slide. In terms of the most disliked videos, the 2021 City Council election, an in interview with Diane Christ, uh, Boulder County Tonight Live, election night special report, a free outdoor concert, uh, a specific uh, planning and zoning meeting on May 19th, and a rational politics video. Uh, what I do want to mention here is that YouTube doesn't tell us why these were the most disliked videos. It could be that the user simply didn't like the producer or the content or who was on it. We simply have no way of knowing. Uh, they, they were just the most disliked. So just something to keep in mind. Next slide. So now I wanna talk about some opportunities as well as some challenges and risks. Next slide. So as of 2022, uh, an average person is predicted to spend 100 minutes per day watching online video, with 85% of the internet audience in the US already watching video online. And more importantly, viewers retain 95% of a message when they watch it in a video. So with so many people watching just so much video, I really believe this is an opportunity for them to be watching local content, either produced for the city or informational city content or other content produced by Lama Public Media or members. Next slide. I truly believe also due to the pandemic that the future is hybrid, meaning both in-person and having a digital video option. As a member to the local YMC, uh, YMCA here in Longmont, um, I know that they recently started offering a digital, digital option for their classes. It made me think about, you know, why couldn't the city of Longmont offer more content like that? Um, so I believe that we have an opportunity here to really uh, produce more programming for the city of Longmont, either informational, educational, or other entertainment-based programming. Um, I was just looking also at the senior, uh, senior services calendar and all the other classes they offer, and there's so much incredible in-person programming. And I just thought, you know, why isn't some of that offered digitally? Um, and there's also just so many local stories to tell here locally. Next slide. Additionally, with 74% of US households having at least one internet connected TV device, such as a smart TV or an over the top player, the future of public access is not cable. It's online and on TV apps, such as Google TV, Android, Android TV, Apple TV, Fire TV, you name it. Lama Public Media should be on it to allow for additional distribution mechanisms so that more residents in town can see all of this amazing content from the city, from members and other local content creators. Next slide. Additionally, I think the COVID pandemic showed that we are severely lacking in media literacy. And we have an opportunity to provide additional resources, training and knowledge on how to use the latest media technology, how to produce content, 
uh, increase self-expression, develop critical thinking, and be more civically responsible. Uh, media literacy is extremely important in keeping our local community well-informed and well-represented. Next slide. Additionally, we, should, we also have an opportunity to make content even more accessible. With Lamont's Latino population hovering around 30%, there's a strong need to produce Spanish-speaking uh, Spanish content and be more inclusive to the city's demographics. We should look at also providing more closed captioning across all the videos produced, as well as digital live channel streams, such as on our website and Roku app. Next slide. And more importantly, I really think that by being at the intersection of aspiring content creators and more experienced filmmakers, Lama Public Media's media makerspace can become where the next generation of content creators and filmmakers come from. I think we have an opportunity here to provide you know, other local content creator incentives or other type of funding opportunities, as well as create more local jobs. Next slide. With these opportunities also come challenges and risks. And as you know, COVID continued to rage on in 2021 with you know, different strains from Delta to Omicron and COVID did continue to affect our media makerspace activities. So our plan to replace dropping franchise and peg fees with makerspace membership is very unlikely to happen this year unless there is a drastic change in the public health environment. Makerspace and co-working space models simply don't work in a pandemic, even if you are part of a vaccine verified program like we were. As you know, this funding was part of how we plan to replace dropping franchise fees. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier on, total membership had increased 157% from 76 members in 2020 to 201 in 2021. Uh, with paying memberships increasing 262% from just eight paying members in 2020 to 29 in 2021. Next slide. Using the past two years as data, we are projecting that we'll be doubling our paid memberships over the next three years with 300 paying members by 2025. Next slide. Another challenge and risk is that nationally Comcast lost another one and a half million residential video subscribers in 2021, or about a 7.8% loss. So as of now, there are about 17 and a half million video subscribers. So franchise fees will continue to decline as Comcast loses video subscribers, which affects local funding. Next slide. As a refresher of PEG versus franchise uh, fees, franchise fees are the fees that a municipality charges a cable company for use of the public right of way. And Longmont Public Media currently receives 25% of those franchise fees from the city. PEG fees are fees levied as part of a franchise agreement and revenue must be used for the, for the capital costs incurred by PEG media infrastructure. These PEG fees are passed on to local Comcast customers at a rate of about 75 cents per, per month or nine bucks a year. Next slide. So what you, uh, the graph that you see here, this is the decline in PEG fees since we were awarded the contract and started in 2020. So in Q1 of 2020, we received a little bit under $25,000 worth of PEG fees. In Q4 of last year, we ended the year with $20,841,000 worth of PEG fees. Next slide. So based on those uh, PEG fees, uh, we estimated that in 2021, we have about 9,600 um, Comcast subscribers in Longmont, which is down from 10,481 in 2020. Next slide. So my question to council uh, is, you know, does the city of Longmont wanna continue investing in a media makerspace in a public access TV station? And if so, the current 25% allocation of the franchise fees isn't enough, especially if additional COVID-19 support ends later this year. Next slide. So I wanna thank you all for your time and I'm available to answer any questions that you may have. My unmute was an unmuting. Councillor Hidalgo Faring. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So um, the slide, so I caught the first question is, 
you know, if we still want to continue um, funding. Um, the second question, what was that? I didn't get to finish writing it down. The second question on the on the last slide. On the last slide, was that a second question or was that? No, it, it was just stating that the current franchise fee allocation of 25% won't be enough. Okay, okay. And then have, do you know of any, um, what numbers are you looking at for the city to contribute? Yeah, I mean, ideally we, you know, we would really like for council to consider you know, giving us 50 to 100% of those franchise fees so that a media makerspace like Lama Public Media can continue to exist past, past my time and for future generations. Okay. Um, and then I do have a comment I appreciate um, about adding the Spanish language um, in, in your programming. You know, my other thing, you know, a comment I wanted to point out was rather than, you know, making sure that it's not just translation of our, um, you know, our, the typical programming, but actually that the programming is culturally relevant, um, that will appeal to our um, Latino community um, to get them interested in, in, in even just in participating as well. You know, how, how much of a reach have you been able to have to our Latino community in utilizing the makerspace or having youth come out and um, and actually explore what you, what you have available. So yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. okay. uh, thank yeah. you, Councillor uh, Waters. Uh, thanks, Mayor Peck. And uh, nice presentation, Sergio. Thanks. Uh, I have two questions for you. The first is this. Um, it's always interesting to me, uh, following the number of hours we spend in these meetings and 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 you live streaming and the in the both the Longmont Leader and the Times Call coverage and the in our as news, um, how varied um, understanding or interpretation of what we do is in the public. Um, so I'm, the first question is this: Are we making the best and highest use of LPM? Or maybe what would you recommend to be the best and use uh, of, of best and highest use of LPM to make certain that accurate information is easily accessible by the public? Number one, about what's going on, what we do, about what the city's doing. Second question is: in addition to franchise fees, what else do you need from us to help help Longmont help Longmont right to help for LPM to help Longmont accomplish? the ends that, that the city establishes? Two questions. Yeah, council member Waters. Uh, so the first first question, so the, the, for the my first answer to your first question would be no, I don't believe the city of Longmont is using LPM to its highest and fullest potential. Um, I think, you know, obviously depending on the priorities of what the city would like for us to focus on, um, I do believe sometimes that should be more PSA is it should be more informational instead of less, um, you know, entertainment based programming. I think um, even just looking uh, online today on uh, one of the Facebook groups here in town um, with people being confused about how uh, the LHA lottery works. And I think Marsha was commenting on on that. Uh, you know, I think that was an opportunity for, you know, just just make let's just make a quick video you know it could take under 30 minutes to an hour and just say you know here's here's the information that you need and we could distribute it everywhere um i think a really good example last year of an informational piece um and i believe uh harold dominguez or sandy cedar had the idea but we did a uh, a tour of the llama public library when it was going through all this construction and that now has you know 1200 1300 views and it you know just showed what was going on and i really think that uh as a city we should be looking at producing more videos like that second question was what do you what can we do to help you help us yeah so as i yeah another great question so as i mentioned again i think we'd really like for city council to consider uh, more franchise fees, but additionally, I mean, just obviously getting the word out, 
um, about Lama Public Media and also individually coming in and use the space, either you know, uh, a weekly conversation with the mayor um, or just council member thoughts, you know, we could interview each one of you or, or something like that, right? I mean, I think there's a wide variety of different opportunities um, to engage obviously as a, as a council with the public um, and just get the public more familiar about us being here. Thanks, Sergio. Any other comments? Uh, Mayor Pro Tim Rodriguez. Thank you very much, Mayor Peck. Uh, so it was outlined that they're currently receiving 25% of the fees, right? Um, so my question is, what is the allocation of the other percentage of those fees? And so that's not necessarily for Sergio. Um, I'll let Sandy jump in. So, so part of it is to, um, they received 25% of the fees last year um, and then council in addition allocated 117,000 the year before and 120,000 since then. So there's been additional allocations um, beyond the 25% of the franchise fees. Um, the remaining part of that is calculated into the general fund budget, correct? That's right. We, we, we treat that like we do general property taxes and sales taxes. It's not earmarked uh, for anything specific. Okay, but it goes into the general fund is what, what I'm hearing. Right. So that, that technically is a council prerogative if they choose to, if we choose to change. Okay, very good. Thank you for that. Um, second question would be, uh, this one I think will go to Sergio. You showed a proposed increase in, uh, I guess you'd call them subscribers or members, um, uh, as well as also the decrease in, in percent uh, in what you get from the percent, the twenty five percent. What is is the gap there? You know, let's say if if we're just trying to keep even, which we know that's not really sustainable, but let's just say if we're trying to keep even, what's what's the gap there as as you see one climbing and one decreasing? Yeah, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Yeah, good question. So I, I believe obviously in the chart that I showed you just of peg fees, it's been we've dropped about four thousand dollars so far. And then in terms of actual franchise fees, and Sandy, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, I believe in 2020 the franchise fees that we collected was about 155,000. Um, this year it was going to be 145,000. Um, so that it's going to continue to drop. Um, I don't know exactly how much, um, but we are trying to offset that obviously with, um, with membership dues. Um, but I think the thing to keep in mind is that as we're increasing membership dues, I mean, the, the services that we would be able to provide to the city for those franchise would still continue to go down. So unless the city would want additional, um, you know, services or to maintain the same level of services, it would still have to maintain so that we could provide the same level of quality. Okay, uh, is LPM allowed advertising space, for instance, to possibly help, help offset some of those? We do have uh, sponsors uh, that we can put on the channel, yes. So you're allowed to do that? Okay. Correct. Uh, there's nothing that uh, prohibits you from doing that? No. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I, I would also just like to state um, that I believe it's a very necessary and vital service uh, that LPM provides the city. Uh, I was a member of public access long, many years ago uh, when it was, you know, the cable trust, if you will, when I was in middle and high school. And so I think it's, it's a really great thing. And I actually plan, especially now that I had a little uh, tour recently where LPM is adding um, facilities uh, for audio recording. And as a musician and somebody who is formerly an audio engineer, at a recording studio that very much interests me. And, you know, I, with the addition of that facility, I'd very likely be uh, adding a membership to it. So I just want to say that they're doing great work and not just uh, maintaining 
what they have as services, but adding additional services that we haven't seen yet uh, in, in the community that I think could be a, a net boon, if you will. Um, so I think it's important for council to consider um, making sure that we continue the viability of LPA. So thank you. Uh, Councillor Martin. Thank you, Mayor Peck. Um, I think also that, uh, I mean, LPM has done a tremendous amount and tremendous variety of things, uh, all working when, you know, the uh, number of people who could who could meet in the, in the public space was limited when people were reluctant to meet in the public space. Um, immediately before the pandemic, uh, we held um, public meetings that would have, you know, 20, 30 people present. Uh, and then of course, you know, that dropped off to the, to the real diehards uh, once, you know, we had to meet virtually or with masks on. Um, and so I propose that uh, the council consider that we need to uh, increase the city subsidy at a, at a level that will at least, you know, sustain the current level of, of growth for another year uh, with the understanding that uh, LPM needs to run a membership campaign, run sponsorship campaigns uh, and get back on the post pandemic road to becoming um, more self-sustaining as the cable trust revenue inevitably tails off. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Any other comments? Um, I would like, um, here's my perception, Sergio, and I, I am speaking of uh, people who were used to Channel 8 before, before Long Public Media took over. The, the perception of people my age and older is that this is a Longmont City, uh, uh, it's another service that the city provides. But I see the name public in there. And I think that maybe more advertising that this is not just a Longmont channel, a Longmont public media. It is. It encompasses. It could encompass Firestone or, or Frederick or Mead. What's going on in other cities? Uh, and that and that is where I'm wondering: Are you reaching out as far as advertising goes? As far as uh, membership drives, uh, reaching out to explain the difference between Longmont Public Media to perhaps the majority, I don't know that it's the majority, but a, a substantial number of people who still think this is a service that the city provides. This is a different entity. It's a different package that you're presenting. And I'm not sure that that is understood. Um, what do you think about that? I... Yeah, that's a great question, Mayor Peck. Um, so we primarily, in terms of advertising, try to target mostly Longmont residents for use of the makerspace for shows such as Sam Post Sessions, right, where it can cater to a larger audience. We do, you know, um, advertise in 5, 10, 15 mile range to try to bring in other people into Longmont, so then they're at least downtown. Um, I do think, yeah, that's a great idea to run um, additional ad campaigns. Um, and now that hopefully we're on the upswing of, you know, kind of returning back to normal, um, I do think that will encourage, you know, more people to come out um, as well as utilize the space. Well, I, I agree. And I look at CPR and NPR and how they run their, their public media and how they run their ad campaigns, but also um, some of their program reaches out to subjects people not necessarily uh, have ever considered listening to or, or watching. And those might actually be in other cities, like what's happening in Boulder? How does that affect Longmont? Does it affect Longmont? Um, 
I, I guess that's what I would like to see a little bit diversity and maybe during a, a program that gets a lot of attention throwing up an advertisement that says, um, I, I don't know how you would say it, but try to explain that it is not a service that their taxes paid for. This is a public media and, and we need your help. All right. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Peck. Yeah, we'll, we'll be working on doing that. Okay, thanks. You were muted, uh, Mayor Peck. I think you said my name. I was trying to read your lips and I think you said Council you, Wayne Albright. You did read my lips, <laughs> good for you. All right, I just wanna say thank you so much, Sergio, for all that you're doing. Um, to uh, Mayor Peck's point, I think as she was speaking, it would be awesome to see like TVs in establishment, like huge buildings that have Longmont um, public media stuff going, like those, uh, the music and things like that going up and um, maybe in the, where people pay their bills, have a TV up and just showing some of the shows. But I also believe, um, and I also agree with council member Waters that we need to inform our community, education, education, education. And I believe that's what you do a lot of, but with all the new projects and everything that's going on, you know, or concerns and things like that, it would be nice to have stuff, you know, more of that on um, LPM. And I think the problem is too, how we, how we um, get in our youth involved. And I, I know you and I had talked about that in the past, but um, I think that's something we can continue to work on, but it's just exposure and letting every, the city know what all you do and what you provide because your, your place is, it's amazing over there and, and I love it myself. And so um, maybe if we can, some of our, local establishments where we can get up some TV screens and have it rolling some of the programs that you do. And when, you know, and then when we're talking about the weather or when you have the news, that's coming from LPM. You know what I'm saying? And that's within our city. So I would like to see something like that. That would be awesome. I don't know if we, you know, I don't know if that's feasible, but that would be nice. But thank you for everything you do. I, I agree with everyone. And I definitely, however we can, make that happen for you, I'm all on board. Councilor Martin. Yeah, has everybody spoken once? Because I want to, you know. Yes, um, they have. Okay. Um, I would just like to clarify something. And I think I think Sergio did make it clear, but uh, you know, the popular assumption would be the opposite. Um, when we say that Longmont Public Media is a maker space, that means that the public is the content creator. Um, LPM records the city events and um, the, L, the producers who work at LPM do some mandated work for the city that creates content. But most of what Sergio listed is content from Longmont residents and they are the creators, they're the makers. So um, the, the, the five person staff at LPM does not, isn't gonna create a lot more content than they are creating now. They're going to buy outreach, get the collective public of Longmont to create a lot more content. And uh, you know, the, the tremendous amount of work that existing members have done in terms of creating classes and other instructional opportunities um, is I think the biggest pandemic level accomplishment that the organization has achieved. And now it's time to capitalize on that because people can begin coming in and taking advantage of that and, and uh, really allowing the creativity of the city as a whole to blossom because this makerspace is here. Thank you, Councilor Martin. Um, Mayor Pro Tim Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor Pat. Quick question. It might have been in the presentation and I missed it, but when is the contract up for renewal? 
Uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, Rodriguez, I believe the contract is up for renewal every year. So I believe, uh, and Sandy, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, I believe once budgeting process starts, is that correct? I'm Mayor Pro Tem, Sandy Cedar, Assistant City Managers. Uh, Sergio is right. The contract is a January to December contract. So you just approved this contract in December. Um, you may remember, and as part of the contract was not only the franchise fees, which were about $140,000, Sergio is right, they've continued to decline, uh, but also the city council decided during the budget season, um, you know, which we usually ask you for this feedback in, in May or so, but during the budget season, uh, you all allocated $120,000 additionally out of your one time in order to stave over what you're hearing from Sergio right now about their decline in membership. The original RFP basically was one that uh, would hopefully make Longmont public media uh, sustainable in the long haul with the membership. But of course, with COVID, as Sergio said, that's been impossible. And so the council has um, in 2021 um, gave $117,000 out of one time budget and in 2022, $120,000. So I'm sure we'll have the conversation again during the budget season. This presentation that Sergio is giving you is a contractual requirement of that December contract. Thank you. As part of partially just to clarify that we will have another crack at this uh, this year. And of course, so yes. We'll we'll be taking another look at this at a later date. So thank you. That's that's what I also wanted to clarify. Thank you. So Sergio, um, do you did you get the direction that you wanted this conversation to go in, or is there something that we haven't given you that you need? Uh, Mayor Peck, no, I think I got a lot of great feedback. So thank you. Thank you to all of you uh, for providing that feedback. Uh, I'll be starting to work on that. Um, and then, yeah, as I, men as I mentioned, um, it was just, you know, for the council to reconsider uh, just a franchise fee allocation, which uh, based on my understanding is something that sounds like you will all do uh, in May. So thank you. Uh, and I want to say the presentation was great. Um, it's amazing everything you do. So thank you, Mayor Peck. Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it is now time for our public invited to be heard. So uh, it is time to dial in now. Can you, there you go. Please call uh, our number. I don't see the number because I have my screen up there. 1-888-788-0099. Enter the meeting ID and uh, press the pound sign. Don't forget to mute your live stream. We'll be back in five minutes.
Hello. 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 Am I allowed to speak? I think we're all in the waiting room, and so. Uh, okay, I wasn't sure I can. Here. Okay. So I need to mute myself. Well, you need to mute the live stream. You know, it's just video. We will call on you by the last three digits of your phone number and allow you to speak at that time. Mayor Peck, we are about 10 seconds out from the five minute mark. And uh, as you saw, we do have some callers eager to talk. Yes, I do see that. So is, has everybody been uh, entered into the waiting room? Um, so I see, let me go through and check. Yeah, so we do have 10 callers. I'm gonna drop the slide now that I see council coming back online. Great, so let's, uh, let's get started and close the public invited to be heard. Sure Colin. thing. And, and All right. Sounds good. Yeah. So caller number 203, caller with the last three digits 203, please hit star six to unmute. If you have the live stream going on in the background, please mute it and state your name and address for the record. Hey there, caller 203. Can you hear us? Was that 6203? 203, the last three digits. Yep, I can hear you now. I think that would be me. <laughs> Hi, my name's Sarah Dawn Haynes. I'm the chair of the Indian Peaks Group Sierra Club, and I reside in uh, South Boulder, Colorado. And I'm also happy that my mom has been a Longmont resident for the last year. And I got to do some research on everyone through the election. But this is my first Longmont Council meeting. And um, that I wanted to call in support of the work you've been already doing on affordable housing. And specifically with the Costco site. But reading the agenda, I'm seeing more projects and hearing Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez speak about um, different issues and um, the council support to make sure that your codes are matching your intentions. Um, we just every day are facing so many really difficult decisions on how to provide housing for our workers and for our community um, to do it equitably and to do it in a way that protects what so many of us um, live living here for, which is 
our um, open spaces, natural spaces. And I just went to the Longmont Museum on Sunday for the beautiful installation of Japanese um, work. And, um, you know, I think um, Council Member Yarbrough's idea about putting up a TV in there, you know, to help people know uh, about um, the media programs would be really great. And um, my auntie and I hadn't seen each other for two years and um, went for a walk along the, um, the local pedestrian stroll. So I just have a, a growing love and appreciation for all the leadership and uh, work that you're doing there. And I just want you to know that the um, Sierra Club is um, paying attention, looking forward to support and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you, Sarah. Next caller. Okay, we're gonna move on to caller with the last three digits, 499. <clears throat> caller 499, please hit star six to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, um, this is Doe Kelly of Barberry Drive in Longmont. And these remarks are for the highest good of all beings. I've spoken to you in the past about dangers and risks of wireless infrastructure and devices that use microwave, microwave carrier waves to transmit data. At our request, you did, to your credit, hold an AMI study session in late 2020. Sadly, you dismissed the learned advice of Dr. Tim Sheckley, an expert participant, that the meters will soon be obsolete, carry big risks, um, and that later, that safer wired technology of the future is nearly here. You took the bad advice on health effects of non-ionizing microwave radiation of a self-admitted non-expert, Bill Hayes, the air quality coordinator for Boulder County Public Health. He's a very nice man, albeit not qualified to opine on this matter, and showed no knowledge of the updated science on wireless harms. He simply parroted the FCC stance that non-ionizing wireless radiation is safe for humans. He can be forgiven that, at least he was honest in stating he really was not an expert, and now we are facing the impending addition of another layer of radio frequency electro smog from the smart meter rollout in Longmont. So a question, do you really think the general public knows what a smart meter is and that it carries real risks and dangers? And if residents were fully informed, do you really think that you would have only a half percent opt-out rate as you've estimated? I warned you of a possible landmark win against the FCC that would place existing FCC radio frequency safety guidelines under scientific scrutiny and in a kind of limbo. Friday the 13th of August last summer was a very lucky day. Plaintiffs side won, and the FCC essentially was ordered by the second highest U.S. court to return to the drawing board to do its homework by considering all the science that had been submitted to the agency, but for the most part was ignored by FCC in its abject failure to adequately update its radio frequency guidelines. A winning attorney on this case, Daphna Takover, said, microwave sickness is likely the most immediate and widespread manifestation of the adverse health effects from radiation emitted from wireless devices and infrastructure. At least 10% of the population has already developed symptoms. The rates are likely higher, end quote. As for the opt-out, is it fair that people like me with EHS, with a toxic response to things wireless, should be forced to pay for protection against having a wireless meter? Or should people instead be given the choice to opt in with no cost to those who say no? I have close neighbors. What if they don't opt no. out? Thank yes. you very much for uh, that information, but your three minutes is up. Okie dokie. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, and moving on to our next caller, caller with the last three digits, 722, caller 722. Would you hit star six to unmute yourself, please? Hey there, can you hear us? Yes. Perfect. 
Hello, Mayor Peck and City Council. I'm Lake Lynette McLean, and I live on Sandpoint Drive in Longmont. I just want to say a few words about the benefits of AMI, or Advanced Metering Infrastructure, or also Smart Meters, which have become a popular replacement to traditional analog meters across the country to read and capture information about electricity and gas use, and in some cities, even water usage. Smart Meters are used in about 75% of all the households in the U.S. They emit the same radio frequency waves as cell phones and Wi-Fi modems. Here are a few advantages. AMI meters eliminate manual meter reading and reduce city employees' work-related injuries from slips and falls, handling heavily, heavy manhole covers and equipment, violent attacks, whether by dogs or humans, vehicle accidents, extreme weather exposure, and repetitive motion injuries. It also prevents stressful encounters with agitated customers, bad traffic, dangerous construction sites, and the like. With shorter trips and the number of vehicles on the road reduced, the utility will reduce vehicle maintenance needs, fuel consumption, and tailpipe emissions. Integrating AMI into the internal and public-facing processes will improve the resolution of customers' inquiries and cost savings in continuous use cases and stabilize rates. The AMI system will allow the city to give better customer service, fewer conventional meters to retranslate to shorter routes with more schedule flexibility to make repairs, and as a result, response times to repair a stopped or damaged meter will be much quicker. Customer care representatives will be more responsive to customer inquiries. Access to high-frequency historic data on customer use from the AMI system allows city representatives to identify the dates of high usage events and ask follow-up questions to identify common causes or help to diagnose potential problems that can contribute to high bills. AMI meters enable real-time remote detection of and automatic alerts for continuous usage. This enhanced detection of continuous usage reduces waste and the resulting cost savings accrue to both the customer and the utility. AMI systems can help address losses by improving meter accuracy, reducing billing and data handling errors and reducing unauthorized connections. AMI supports efforts to improve efficiency, decrease the demand on limited resources, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and move towards 100% renewable energy. So beyond reducing waste through timely detection of continuous usage, Real-time high-frequency meter data will empower customers to understand their bills and adjust their usage accordingly. AMI meters thus complement other efficiency and conservation initiatives, such as public education, low-use-based incentives, and the promotion of efficient appliances and fixtures. Thank you for implementing AMI metering. Thank you, Lynette. Thanks. Uh -huh. Bye-bye. Bye. Next caller, please. Sure thing. Our next caller has the last three digits 073. Caller 073. Please hit star six to unmute yourself. Hey, caller 073, can you hear us? Hey, yes. Great, we can hear you. Awesome. Hi, uh, City Council. My name is Michelle Jones. I live on Grant Street in Longmont, and I am here to quickly voice support for agenda item 9G, um, the resolution approving intergovernmental agreement and easement for the Longmont Art in Public Places mural partnership on the Spoke Building. Um, and I am a commissioner on the Art in Public Places Commission, newly appointed and just excited to get more involved in general in the community of Longmont. I think the mural will add um, a prominent and visible art presence to a new and exciting building, spoke on Kaufman. Um, I'm excited that uh, we will have the community help us choose an artist. Um, the mural will be part of the greater theme of transportation and a hub and kind of a central piece, I think, of the Longmont Main Street area. Um, it will be funded by the Art in Public Places budget, and um, I think it will enhance the area as a whole, um, bring more attention to Art in Public Places, which is always working to add more art to our community, which we hope enhances the lives of community members and visitors alike. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Next caller, please. 
Sure thing. We're moving to the caller with the last three digits, 878. Caller 878. If you are there, do you mind hitting star six to unmute yourself? Hey, caller 878, can you hear us? I can. Great. We can hear you. Okay. Thank you so much. My name is Cecilia Doucette from Ashland, Massachusetts, and I'm the Director of Massachusetts for Safe Technology and the international nonprofit Wireless Education. Like some of you, I had no idea there could be health, safety, or welfare issues with wireless technology until an engineer friend tipped me off. I'm a tech writer by trade, so I investigated and was astounded to discover literally thousands of peer-reviewed published studies showing biological harm. I helped my schools become the first in the nation to take precautions. I have worked on wireless radiation bills in several states. New Hampshire is the first in the nation to investigate, and they have issued a groundbreaking commission report from highly qualified doctors, scientists, engineers, and legislators. They document the science showing extensive harm from electrosmog, as well as conflicts of interest between the industry and our captured federal agencies. I will send that report out to you. As the pandemic taught us, we need to be vigilant about invisible toxins. Science indicates we should be at 0.1 microwatts per square meter of radiation indoors. When I measured the radiation pulsing into my home from two digital electric meters, there were 500 microwatts per square meter, which is 5,000 times too high. They pulse this invisible radiation 17,000 times per day. There is no escape and the damage is cumulative. We are seeing radiation harm play out right now, right now in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, where children and adults were injured and pollinators disappeared when Verizon turned on a cell tower on top of their neighborhood. Their Board of Health just voted unanimously to issue a cease and desist order. We can have excellent technology and close the digital divide, but only with future-proof high-speed cable or fiber to and through the premises. The industry will sell you what is easiest and most profitable for them, but our public servants' goal should be responsible technology with radiation levels as low as reasonably achievable. That's the ALARA principle, as low as reasonably achievable, which the Centers for Disease Control already uses for ionizing radiation from the sun, x-rays, and gamma rays. It's time to add common sense ALARA protections for toxic non-ionizing wireless radiation too, which is what smart meters constantly emit today. The retired president of Microsoft Canada, Frank Clegg, indicates the industry can do much better if given a nudge. This applies to smart meters, cell towers, and 5G small cells, as well as the networks and devices throughout our town, schools, homes, and offices. We should really be measuring the radiation from the wireless tablets issued to students during the pandemic and teaching families how to use them safely. Please know- Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Your three minutes are up. All right. I'd be honored to join you to co-host a community education forum. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Sure thing. We're moving on to the caller with the last three digits, 119. Caller 119, would you unmute yourself? Hey, caller 119. Hello. Hello. Mayor, and council, Mayor and council members, this is Karen Dyke. I live at 708 Hayden Court. I'm co-chair of the Sustainable Resilient Longmont's Renewable Energy Committee. I'm speaking tonight in support of the ordinance regarding the AMI metering opt-out plan. It is exciting to see that Longmont Power and Communications is ready to roll out an advanced metering and infrastructure, a move that, like the build-out of Nextlight fiber optic system, will pay many dividends. Utilities have installed over 100 million smart meters on homes and businesses nationwide, and like all of those, this continued evolution of the city's infrastructure will provide a 21st century tool to keep pace with a rapidly changing world. AMI will give the city much more flexibility in structuring variable rates that can help consumers maximize use at times when electricity use is at its lowest 
such as in the early morning, or when supply is highest, such as during high wind production. I'm excited to have access to technology that in the end can help consumers use electricity more efficiently and save money. Knowledge is power, and AMI provides greater control over electricity bills, allowing customers to see in detail how much energy they are using. AMI also brings Longmont one step closer to achieving 100% carbon-free energy. The way the world manages and generates electricity is changing rapidly, and the future is going to be quite different from our present. Power production will be less centralized than it is now, and AMI gives Longmont the ability to manage innovations in power productions as they develop. Of course, there are skeptics, but the widespread adoption of AMI has proven it to be a safe and reliable technology. Fears about fire and radiation risk have proven to be completely unfounded. An opt-out plan will be available for those who remain skeptical. AMI keeps Longmont ahead of the curve on power infrastructure, giving our growing city a big economic advantage. Longmont has a history of making and supporting good choices on infrastructure investment. It's gratifying to see that legacy continues with AMI. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. All right, and moving on to our next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 240. Caller 240, would you hit star six to unmute yourself? Hey there, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Great, we can hear you. All right, my name is Kim Edmondson. I live at Bittersweet Lane here in Longmont, Colorado, and I'm calling about the smart meters. And I'm very concerned about them. I see you're all very concerned about the health and well-being of our community, but yet you seem to ignore this invisible danger. Smart meters and cell phones occupy similar frequency bands of the electromagnetic spectrum, meaning that all data on the effects of cell phone radiation equally applies to that of smart meters. Prolonged pulses from these meters can average or occur 9,600 times a day on average and can lead to cancer. As of May 31st, 2011, the WHO has classified radio frequency electromagnetic fields as a class 2B carcinogen. Smart meters operate with much more frequency pulses than cell phones. Cell phone radio frequency radiation is concentrated to the head and body part, which is in contact with. Rest smart meters expose the entire body. I can minimally or not use my phone, but I won't be able to shut off your smart meters. And I sure in the hell cannot afford to opt out of them either. There's no safety level of exposure, safe level of exposure established for radio frequency radiation. I learned that when I was in x-ray tech over 20 years ago. Alara, the gal from Massachusetts, she brought that up. I learned that it's real. These poles create more dirty electricity in our homes as well. There was even one point where a patent was taken after using millimeter waves as an insecticide because it was so effective at killing the insect. If it's going to do that to the pollinators, what's that going to do to the rest of the ecosystem? Our whole ecosystem is going to collapse if we continue this push for all of this 5G smart meter hoopla. Daniel Hirsch, who was a retired professor from the Program on Environmental and Nuclear Policies at UC Santa Cruz, stated that the analysis of misleading reports on smart meter radiation by the EPRI, when you correct for two factors, whole body and cumulative doses, smart meters turned out to be roughly 100 times more exposure than a cell phone. Marsha Martin has many times stated on social media the complete opposite, that its cell phones give 100 times more of the radiation. Well, it's not true. She's spreading lies. Radiation from smart meters absorbed at faster rates in children and more intensely in their bodies. In I have seven year old twins that I'm very concerned about. Hey, you gave the guy how many minutes for his little presentation? I think I can finish. There's 113 peer reviewed studies on the effects of birds, insects, and other vertebrates, organisms, and plants. 70% of those showed a negative impact on the reproduction of birds and insects are most strongly affected. So basically, we're going to kill the entire ecosystem before climate change will. So therefore, I don't think that's a good trade-off. Carbon free at what expense? Seriously, think about it. Thank you, Kimberly. Okay, and moving on to our next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 879. Caller 879, please hit star six to unmute yourself. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, good evening. Thank you for all of your service. And I would also like to talk about smart meters. 
I want to bring to your attention a few points Excuse that me. have been left out. Excuse me, can, mm -hmm. can we have your name first? Certainly, Christina Williams. <laughs> Thank and you. I live on Quail in Longmont. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so I've heard people talking about breach of privacy, and I looked into what exactly they're talking about. I have a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from CU Boulder, and I would like to point out that every time a piece of equipment with a motor comes on, it causes a small back EMF. Each motor has a type of signature voltage when it comes on. So I could actually watch the voltage fluctuation of power and see that, oh, your furnace just came on, or oh, your refrigerator just came on. In fact, I could even see that your refrigerator might need repair. So are you guys going to sell that information so that I will start getting ads for refrigerators? Why not? That's exactly what Google did, and they made millions of dollars doing it. My personal EMF signature information is not for sale, and it's none of the city's business or anyone else's business. This type of espionage is not possible with the old-fashioned analog meters. Let's talk about transmission of privacy concerns. In less than an hour, I found several videos on YouTube about how to hack spread spectrum technologies and smart meters specifically. Mike, uh, you know who he is, reassures me that the spread spectrum technology used is encrypted and safe. Sure, it is. It's safe as any transaction is online or on any computer, and computers are all subject to hacking. But the old-fashioned analog meters were not subject to this. You'll introduce these risks with the smart meters. The smart meters have switches in them, which allow the city to turn the power on and off. This introduces the possibility of drawing too much current, which leads to fire. Again, not a problem in the old analog meters. Let's talk about carbon footprint. How exactly are smart meters going to reduce carbon emissions? Do your voters know that in order to avoid firing up another gas generator during peak hours, that the city could decide to impose roving blackouts like they already do in California? You know, the state whose tyrannical practices are the reason why a lot of people have moved to Longmont in the last five years? I don't need any help maximizing my use. Am I supposed to eat dinner at 11 o'clock p.m. when it's cheaper? This brings me to uh, how does this bring Longmont closer to 100% renewable energy? Exactly how? We still use natural gas to generate electricity. We don't need smart meters for solar panels or for wind. Do your voters know that you plan to pay for this $14 million installation by increasing their electricity uh, prices? When, right when everyone needs them. And of course, I don't even need to talk about the increase of forced radiation exposure, which we already know is a documented health Christina, hazard. Christina, thank you so yes. much. Your three minutes are up. Thank you for the information. Great. Have a good evening. Uh, I would like to mention that I think you should vote, that I think we should bring this on the ballot in Longmont. The citizens of Longmont should vote on whether or not we want. Good comment. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the next caller, caller 569, caller 569, would you please hit star six to Hi. unmute yourself? Hello, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Steve Pittman. I'm a resident of Longmont and a member of Longmont Public Media. Um, I'm actually proud to be helping uh, produce uh, content there, although I should emphasize helping. I'm uh, not one of the um, people doing a lot, but um, I'd like to highlight in Sergio's presentation that one of the more popular programs was the um, candidate debates that Longmont Public Media put on uh, prior to the last election, which I think was very helpful. And I'm proud to say that I was helping Kim Waters with his backstory series and trying to increase the uh, profile of that uh, content. I think he has at least a dozen episodes out there, probably more with all sorts of information about Longmont infrastructure and uh, things like the um, uh, supply of water for Longmont and, and how we're looking relative to a, a lot of uh, cities in the West uh, as far as our water supply goes. So I would um, hope that listeners would uh, yeah, look at the Longmont Public Media YouTube channel and uh, find Tim's uh, backstory series and enjoy them and learn from them. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
All right, and moving on to our last caller, caller 798, caller with the last three digits, 798. Hey there, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, My name's Virginia Farber, I'm from Fort Collins. Um, I would like to, I'm gonna talk about AMI meters. Um, Just to let everybody know, the the smart meters were never meant to be an opt-out. They were always to be an opt-in, that this was something that was never brought to the public. And besides the obviously surveillance issues, uh, smart meters also have many other problems. They emit lots of radiation. One smart meter can transmit 1.8 miles of radiation, and this is pulsed in there, and it's very, very dangerous. And uh, I've, I've actually uh, met with Poudre Valley Fire here in Fort Collins, and I have confirmed that there have been house fires. And I actually suspect that these, uh, the smart meters do not have uh, surge protectors in them. So I actually am uh, thinking that this might have been some of the problem with the Boulder fires, by the way. Um, utilities, uh, they own, maintain, and operate their utilities. And smart meters are part of their equipment. And so uh, the uh, residents are actually paying around an estimate of $100 a year to run these um, little computers on the sides of their homes. On August 13th of 2021, the CHG, the Children's Health Defense Council with Robert Kennedy Jr. won a case against the FCC for health effects of wireless. I was one of the plaintiffs on the case, and this was a landmark case. Um, attorney, attorneys Daphne Tackover and Scott McCulloch did a stellar job at this. Um, I'm in the film called Take Back Your Power, and you can access this online. It's takebackyourpower.net, and this is a um, film about an investigation into the smart grid and the smart meters itself. And so I just, I, I really urge you guys to uh, uh, watch the film and you'll see a lot of the other problems that are involved. Um, on April 6th of this year in Tennessee, there will be a case that goes to the courts there over the health effects of these smart meters. And several of the other states are finding out that these cannot be mandatory and this should have always been brought to the public as an opt-in issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Virginia. All right, and matter of fact, that was the last of our callers. Oh, great. So I'd like to thank all of the callers who called in and took the time to address uh, council. Uh, We now are at the consent agenda uh, and introduction and reading by title of first reading ordinances. Dawn, would you please read the items on consent into the record? Absolutely, Mayor Peck. Resolution 2020-16, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and the Longmont Downtown Development Authority for support and services. 9B is resolution 2022-17, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the amended and restated special council contract between the city and Kaplan, Kirsch, and Rockwell LLP for development, redevelopment, and urban renewal special council services. 9C is resolution 2022-18, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and Weld County for the provision of county reimbursable child care at the Longmont Summer Day Camp. 9D is resolution 2022-19, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and Boulder County for the provision of county reimbursable child care at the Longmont Summer Day Camp. 9E is resolution 2022-20, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City of Longmont and Boulder County for the lease of the Boulder County Fairgrounds for Rhythm on the River. 9F is resolution 2022-21, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City and the State of Colorado for grant funding for restoration and preservation of the Callahan House through the History Colorado State Historical Fund. 9G is resolution 2022-22, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement and easement between the city and the housing authority of the County of Boulder for a Longmont Art and Public Places mural partnership on the Spoke Building. 9H is resolution 2022-23, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the 
Intergovernmental Agreement between the City and the State of Colorado for grant funding for a housing needs assessment and incentive updates. 9 is Resolution 2022-24, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the Intergovernmental Agreement between the city and the, pardon me, and the city of Louisville, Colorado for disaster assistance. And 9J is approved for capital improvement program amendments. Are there any items that councilors would like to pull from the consent agenda? Um, I actually would like to pull 9I for just a statement. Uh, with that, may I have a motion to uh, move the consent agenda, agenda minus 9I? Uh, Councillor Martin. Move the consent agenda minus item 9I. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. So that the consent agenda has been moved minus 9I by Councillor Martin and seconded by Councillor Waters. All those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you. We now have uh, four capital improvement program amendments. No, I'm sorry, that's wrong. We now, have, we now have ordinance on second reading and public hearing on any matter. If you would like to speak on any of the second reading and public hearing items, please call in now to speak on any of them. The information is being uh, displayed on the screen. Please mute the live stream and dial in now. That number is 1-888-788-0099. We'll take a five minute break to give everyone time to get dialed in.
Mayor Peck, we're about 15 seconds out from the five minute mark. Currently no callers. No callers. Thank you very much, Dallas. Um, let's go ahead and uh, close that. Sure thing. And we will get started on the items on the second agenda. The ordinance is on second reading and public hearing. The first item is ordinance 2022-05. It's a bill for an ordinance making additional appropriations for expenses and liabilities of of the city of Longmont for the fiscal year beginning January 1st, 2022. The public hearing and second reading scheduled for February 22nd, 2022. Um, do we have anybody from staff? Jim uh, Golden, would you like to make any remarks about no this? No presentation, Mayor. No presentation, okay, thank you. Um, is There's no one on the phone, but I would like to open the public hearing on ordinance 22. 2022-05. No one in the room to call? That is, that is correct. There are no callers. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'd like to close the public hearing. Um, I would like a motion for council member to uh, move ordinance 2022-05. Move ordinance 2022-05. And thank you. Thank you, Councillor Waters. And thank you, Susie Hidalgo Faring for seconding that. Um, can we have a motion on 20, I'm sorry, we have the motion. All those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed? Thank you, that passes unanimously. Item B on the second reading is 2022-06, a bill for an ordinance amending chapter 14.20 of the Longmont Municipal Code on service charges to create an AMI electric meter opt-out program Public hearing and second reading scheduled for February 22nd, 2022. There is no pre there are no presentation from this. Are there any questions from council? Seeing none, we will open the public hearing on ordinance 2022-06. Dallas, do we have anybody on the phone? There are no callers, nope. Thank you. Um, so at this time, I'd like to close the public hearing and uh, can I have a motion for 2022-06? Councilor Martin. Move 2022-06. Thank you, do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Councilor Waters. It's been moved by 2022-06. The bill for an ordinance amending chapter 14.2 of the municipal code was moved by Councilor Martin and seconded by Councilor Waters. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed. That passes unanimously. So now we are on items removed from the consent agenda, which was 9I, I removed that. And that was uh, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the IGA between the sit our city and the city of Louisville. The reason I removed this is that the Mayor Stoltzman, the uh, mayor of Louisville, called me before the meeting and she wanted me to extend her heartfelt thank you to council and city staff for all the help that they have received through, uh, through this horrible episode of the fire uh, destruction. It, it's heavy on her heart. And she said, I love Longmont, which made my heart feel good. So uh, with that, I would like to move re uh, or resolution 2022-24. Can I have a second? Uh, it's been seconded by Susie Hidalgo Faring. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed, thank you. That passes unanimously. We are now at the end almost of our uh, meeting. We are now at uh, general business. We need to recess as the Longmont City Council and convene as the board of directors of the Longmont General Improvement District number one. Can I have a motion to um, recess as the city council and convene as the board of directors for Longmont General Improvement District number one? So moved. Thank you. Um, second. 
I'll take uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. That has been moved by Councillor Waters, seconded by uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. All those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed, thank you. That passes unanimously. We have a resolution of RLGID-2022-01. It's a resolution, resolution of the Board of Directors of the Longmont General Improvement District Number 1, approving an intergovern intergovernmental agreement with the Longmont Downtown Development Authority for administrative services. Do we have anyone that wishes to speak on this? Kimber Kimberly, are, do you have anything you would like to say on this or are you good to go? It looks like there's no uh, comments. No. No, Mayor, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Kimberly. Um, so can I have a motion to move R-LGID 2022-01? Have we already made that motion? Tim Waters did. There you go. And uh, who seconded that? That's right. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tim. It's been a long day. So it has been moved by Tim Waters to move RLGID-2022-01 and seconded by uh, Mayor Pro Tim Rodriguez. All those in favor, raise your hand. All those opposed, thank you. That passes unanimous, unanimously. Can I have a motion to adjourn as the Board of Directors of the Longmont General Improvement District number one and reconvene as the Longmont City Council? Uh, Councillor Yarbrough, you've had your hand up several times trying. Would you move this, make this motion? I move that we adjourn. Um, what was all that you said? We adjourn and move back into city council. Thank you. She makes the motion to adjourn as the board of directors of the Longmont General Improvement District number one and reconvene as the Longmont City Council. May I have a second? Councillor Hidalgo Faring seconded that. All those in favor, raise your hand. All those opposed, thank you very much. Now we have on general business, we have the B South Clover Basin Neighborhood Park Master Plan and consideration of Clark Meadows Park as the official park name. Uh, Steve Ransweiler, would you like to come on camera and give us a presentation? Thank you, Mayor Peck. Uh, Mayor, Council Members, Steve Ransweiler, Senior Project Manager with uh, Public Works and Natural Resources. Uh, I'm pleased to bring to you tonight a um, master plan and a proposed name for our what we've been using a working title called South Clover Basin Neighborhood Park. Uh, this park has been acquired, been, been long planned, going back about 15 years. And um, we have pro property that was dedicated by two different developers to the city uh, for the construction of this park. It's about seven acres in size. And um, we are, yeah, we, we went through a nice public process with the, um, with the community, uh, held meetings at Blue Mountain Elementary School to try to engage uh, youth and uh, different property owners um, in that area, but it was open to the whole, the whole city, uh, citywide. It was advertised citywide. This is back in 2019 and uh, came up with some concepts. If you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, Dallas, please. Sorry, yeah, next slide. Um, this is located in a, a newer part of the city. Um, along the Western side of this map is North 75th Street. So the very Western edge of the city. I'm sorry, take that back. That's Plateau, it's Plateau, it's not 75th. This is South of Pike Road. And um, unfortunately, this is right within 300 feet of the horrific um, shooting that happened earlier this year. It gives you a little bit of context uh, with the, the postal carrier. Um, you can see uh, the location of the, the park site right in the center of your screen. And uh, a lot of this stuff that is shown as under construction or um, under review is already built and people live in there. So um, we are, um, pleased to be able to bring this facility to the public at some point in the future. Well, future starting this year. If one more thing before we switch sides, in order for the, the one thing that's not done yet is the North Star development, which is in the bottom left of that corner. They are still installing their utilities and doing their grading. 
Um, and speaking with the developer, you can see the, their development abuts the south and part of the western side of the, of the future park. We need for them to build the roads and utilities and get the grade set in order for us to start construction of the park. So that is something that is outside of our control. And speaking with the developer, um, they hope to have the site ready for us to start using in uh, July or August of this year. So that is one thing that we'll be holding up. We are working on design and have been coordinating for years with developers to make sure their plans meshing with what, what we're trying to do. But uh, there is a little bit outside of the city's control, but the site is not quite ready for construction yet. Next slide. Um, hard to read this one, I apologize. It's just the, these designs came up in a vertical or a porch rather than the landscape, so I couldn't make them all that big. But uh, like I said, we came up with three different concepts, brought those three concepts back to the public through the website and through public meetings. Um, they gave input on the three, we combined it into a single plan, brought that back to the, the um, the public and asked for input on that, brought that plan to the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, and now I'm pleased to uh, bring it for your uh, review tonight and, and um, see if you would like to accept this plan as is or would like to suggest some changes. Some of the things that are included in this master plan are typical park improvements such as a restroom and a shelter, an open turf area, um, and a playground. Now, one thing we're going to do here, we're going to try to build another nature themed play area. Um, those are becoming quite the rage uh, around the front range these days and uh, seem to be well liked by the public. So that's the, the concept behind this, um, the, the playground at this location. Um, residents wanted to have some outdoor fitness stations. If you remember, those were very favorable back 35, 40 years ago in parks sort of fell out of favor, but the, the technology and, and, and quality of those have come a long way. And so the, the residents were interested in having those interspersed throughout the park. Um, like you saw with uh, Nino Gallo Park that we visited last month, this will also include posts for people to install their slack lines and hammocks. That's probably gonna be something you're gonna see in most every park, because it's really like $500 to put in two posts. So uh, it's a really, it's a no brainer and people like to use those up in, uh, especially in Boulder County area. Um, there's an existing ditch through the center of the site, uh, sort of runs diagonally from about 10 o'clock down to four o'clock. Uh, the rest of the ditch has been abandoned uh, with all the development. The irrigation ditch, ditch doesn't um, function anymore, but it was desired by, the by people to try to keep that historic agricultural feel of the area and what we could left. So we're designing a bridge over that dry ditch. It'll have water in it when it rains, but uh, it'll be a place for kids to get down and, and maybe find some uh, little small animals under the nooks and crannies. I understand that kids get out there and try to catch frogs now while they're, you know, before the park is even built. So there is some uh, wildlife out there, small. Um, again, we have a concrete loop trail and then some soft surface trails. And then one of the, the, the um, things that the public really wanted to see and what we're lacking here is um, bike skills areas. We have built one at Dickens Farm Nature Area. If you remember several years ago, there was an imp impromptu one uh, near Left Hand Creek Park that was built by some members of the public, um, but which was has since been removed to protect that wildlife over there, that habitat. Uh, but this is an area, it's, it's sort of a smaller pump track, but it, it, it is going to be something for mostly the youth uh, it's not like anything like South Boulder, or I'm sorry, not South Boulder, but um, some of the bike skills areas in Boulder that have these big, large piles of dirt, nothing like that. This is something that's more um, geared toward kids that are two to 10. Um, and that's literally what we got out of the public meetings. So this is the master plan as presented, as you'll see with some of the, the coloring there. Um, we are trying to preserve as much of the native grasses as possible um, for water reduction purposes, but we will have an open turf area as we include with most all of our parks for people to picnic and, and uh, play with their, their dog and throw frisbee, frisbee and things like that. With that, I, I present this draft master plan and, and I'm willing to take any sort of questions or suggestions from council. Do we have any, uh, Mayor Pro Tim Rodriguez? Uh, thank you, Mayor Peck. Just a quick question as far as the 
adjacent outlots A, B, and F on the maps, which is three different subdivisions. Uh, they seem to also be specifically adjacent to what you were also talking about as native grasses. Is there going to be some contiguity uh, as native grasses in those outlots, or are they going to be turf and then we'll have native grasses? All three of those outlets, thank you for bringing that up, Mayor Peck, Mayor Pro Tem, Rodriguez. Um, all three of those outlots, three different developments, but they all are planted with native grasses already. So we'll be tying in with those. Uh, we have been working, um, council may, be re may remember from late last year, we did work with uh, a local group and trapped and transported uh, prey dogs from this site over to Rocky Flats, which was a successful relocation effort that we went through. Um, it was a lot, most of the volunteer was, or most of the labor was volunteered. So it was a good deal for the city. And um, there's still some prairie dogs out there that we're, we're, we're trying to work around, trying to work with the remnant prairie dogs. Of course, prairie dogs don't understand property boundaries. And so we're trying to work with those HOAs to remove the prairie dogs once and for all in this area so it can be a finished urban developed park. So that is the plan. All right, thank you. And I was just wondering, are any of those outlots um, detention ponds? The outlot B, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez, outlot B to the west it has a detention pond in it. All right, thank you. That being said, there is likely some storm drainage capacity in the other two outlots of some type, but um, not they're not ponds themselves. It looks really interesting, uh, Steve. I uh, I really like the uh, outdoor area where the kids can, it's not the typical playground. I really like that. Um, so you need to have us uh, consider the Clover Meadows Park as the official park name. Can I have a motion from somebody to uh, move that forward? So moved. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. And I heard, okay, uh, Councillor Yarbrough seconded that. So all those in favor of consideration of Clover Meadows Park as the official park name, please raise your hand. All those opposed? Thank you. That passes unanimously. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Mayor Peck and Council. If I could just, are we also providing approval of the master plan itself? Oh, There of were course. two action items on the communication. So if we can just get confirmation that the plan is approved with changes or with, as is, I'd help, that would help me. So uh, once again, do we have a, a motion to approve the master plan for the uh, Basin Neighborhood Park? Uh, Councillor Martin is moving that. Do I have a second? Okay, seconded by Councillor Hidalgo Faring. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Great, that passes unanimously. You got it, Steve. Thanks, Mayor Peck, I appreciate it. You're welcome. Have a good night. You too. So now we have two resolutions of the Longmont City Council authorizing agreements between the city and the estate of Joseph Kelleher for the purchase of real property. The first resolution is 2022-25. It's a resolution of the Longmont City Council authorizing agreements between the city of Longmont and the estate of Joseph P. Kelleher for the purchase of real property for, for preservation of agricultural land surrounding Union Reservoir. Can I have, uh, Ken, do you want to have anything to say about this? Um, yes, I do have a short presentation. Okay. Um, if we could load that up, please. So this presentation is also going into the uh, second resolution as well. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. The, the, there are, are two resolutions for this. Um, to accomplish this one item. Um, okay. What we wanted to do first before we get into the specific um, acquisition we're proposing is to give City Council a quick update on really what the Union Reservoir Land Acquisition uh, Plan is. And on our next slide, um, we have uh, give you a little bit of background on the um, Union Reservoir Land Acquisition Plan. Um, in 1986, the City of Longmont voters passed a bond issue to allow the city of Longmont to acquire um, controlling interest in the shares of the Union Reservoir Company, which we did. Um, also at the same time in 1986, the city of Longmont filed uh, a, for a conditional water storage right to allow us to enlarge Union Reservoir 
to provide additional water storage for the future. Um, over the last 30 years or so, um, Longmont has also accepted a number of the shares in the company as part of non-historical water rights dedication uh, through development of parts of the town. And as a result, Longmont currently has 86% um, ownership in the Union Reservoir uh, Company itself. As part of that uh, enlargement uh, filing, Longmont needed to look at um, the land around the reservoir and make sure that we could preserve and protect that. And so in the early 1990s, um, city council directed staff to initiate a land acquisition program around the uh, reservoir. And the next slide will show you a map of that area that we've been working on. Um, if you can see the area around the reservoir, um, those areas that are marked that with the uh, angled line are areas we have not acquired, but the remainder of the areas with the, the dots um, and, and are areas that Longmont has already acquired. So this has been really one of the very effective um, projects that Longmont has done over the years. Um, the, the purpose of having the Union Reservoir Land Acquisition Program, obviously the very first and most important purpose is to preserve this area for the future enlargement of Union Reservoir, but it also accomplishes a number of other uh, uh, goals for the city, uh, including it, cre it helps create an urban buffer east of Weld County Road 1, um, which ties in well, if you look on the right side of the map, parcels S and R, um, as well as the double six and the newbie open space are open space parcels we've acquired. And these properties around the reservoir tie in with that well to, to create that um, buffer on the east side of Longmont. Also, a lot of these um, parcels are in wildlife habitat areas and it, it preserves those. Um, a lot of it is prime agricultural land, uh, especially on the east side of the reservoir, and we've been able to preserve that um, agricultural land. There are also two major trail corridors um, through this area, and acquiring these properties will uh, allow us to continue uh, our trail construction and uh, connection uh, programs around the reservoir. Um, it also, from, from the east side, especially looking to the west towards Longmont, it preserves the view shed of the reservoir itself, especially for um, those who recreate in the area. And finally, um, almost as equally as important as, as the enlargement is the fact that by preventing development immediately around the reservoir, the land around the reservoir almost all of it uh, drains into the reservoir. And so if that were to be developed, there would be additional water quality impacts from any development that occurred around there. That's really one, one of the um, problems that occur in a lot of the front range uh, reservoirs. And by keeping that development further away from the reservoir, it helps uh, keep the uh, water quality uh, much higher. So this program has been uh, exceptional to date. Um, the next slide I'll, we'll show you kind of a blow up of the area right where um, the uh, proposed acquisition is. It's marked on there as the Calcar parcel, which is shown as parcel E. Um, and if, if the city are, is able to acquire this, it, it really kind of helps um, complete uh, other parcels we've already purchased, as you can see, North and South, D, F, G, and H have all been purchased by the city. There is one parcel, J, South, that we still need to acquire. But um, this is one of the critical uh, parcels on the west side of the reservoir. Um, as you may recall, um, recently we opened up the Spring Gulch number two trail, and that trail goes across parcel L and N, which are, are have previously been purchased. But as part of the um, city's long range planning for trails around Union Reservoir, there are really two trails. One is a perimeter trail around the entire reservoir. And this parcel E is one of the few parcels that we really need to acquire um, before we could 
complete that entire perimeter trail. It also, there part of that trail is, is to make a connection between the Spring Gulch Trail down on Parcel L up through Parcel D and then across County Line Road 1 to Jim Ham Pond Nature Area. So this one particular parcel of property would allow that connection to be made as well, which really will, will help that out. Um, primarily, we're trying to get this um, parcel to protect the west side of the, of the reservoir. There is um, one house on the property that um, will be acquired. Um, and as part of the negotiations with the uh, estate, the, the, the current owner uh, passed away this last year, but the estate as part of that negotiation, um, we have negotiated a three-year lease um, for uh, the relative of, of the owner who is currently living in the house. That really helped Longmont um, move forward with being able to be the, I guess, all, the chosen purchaser. This is a pretty pristine, great, there's a really great parcel property. And uh, uh, it, was, it was good that we were able to uh, do that. So if the city retains ownership of that parcel, then um, after the three year period, we'll be able to work um, with the affordable housing uh, folks and, and see how we can work that into our system. Um, as far as the um, actual funding for this project, for this purchase, it was approved earlier on the on the council agenda tonight on second reading. Um, the money was appropriated, so we're we're ready and to go on that. Um, and really, on the next slide, um, we just want to forward both water board and staff recommendation is to acquire this additional parcel of property out at Union Reservoir, um, and. We're re requesting two things. One is to approve the resolution number 25, which uh, authorizes the city to enter into the sales contract. Once we, the, the estate has already signed that sales contract. So once you approve it tonight, it'll be signed and then the sales contract will be finalized and we'll close um, later in this week. And then the second resolution we ask is number 26, which authorizes a short-term two-month um, lease of that property um, for the current tenant um, in it. So and the next uh, slide is just, uh, clo we'll close it down and thank you for your, for your time tonight. And I'd be happy to answer any questions about um, either the land acquisition program or the uh, particular parcel we're looking at purchasing at this time. Thank you. Do counselors have any questions about this? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mayor Peck. First of all, I'd just like to let it be known that the late Joseph Kelleher was my childhood dentist, <laughs> as also uh, the family uh, were neighbors of my family when I was growing up. That being said, I have not spoken to the family in nearly two decades. Uh, but my condolences on the passing of both Lynn and Joe to the Kelleher family. As such, though, I would move that we uh, go forward with the acquisition of the Kelleher property. I'll second that. Um, I do have a question for you, Ken. Um, it does say for the uh, preservation of agricultural land, is this land considered open space or is there something in the documentation uh, that it cannot be developed on? Um, like, do we need a conservation easement? Um, um, so this, uh, the funding for this um, acquisition will be coming out of the water acquisition fund. Okay. Um, it's, it, it would not be classified as an open space parcel of property, but it would be, um, limited to um, use in the water uh, system because we have our, our funding it out of water acquisition. Um, it really is up to city council how we um, uh, operate and maintain this over future times. Okay, I, I just, I just wanna make it sure that it's preserved uh, for what the intended purpose is as councils come and go that um, it is the city that has control over this land. Yes. Not, not a developer. Um, Dale. 
if I could just real quick, uh, Mayor Peck, I think you bring up a, a good uh, question. Uh, as council knows, we always work with another agency, typically either Boulder County or the Soil Conservation District to place conservation easements over all the city's open space properties for that very purpose to um, aid in the long-term preservation of the property for its intended use. We, we haven't historically done that on, on uh, properties acquired by the water utility, but that may be something um, the city wants to look at in the future. We would have to do it in a way though that would preserve the city's prerogative to uh, utilize the property for water storage. But, you know, I think you're bringing up a, a point that we might want to consider if that's something council wants us to look at. Well, Dale, since we're going to be losing you and I don't know who's going to replace you, we might have to want to preserve this land. Uh, there could be something in the documentation that basically says, um, I'm, I'm just thinking aloud really that it is not to be sold, period. Um, so anyway, I, I'm, I just think we should think about that for the future. So this, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, does anyone else have any remarks? It didn't at first. Okay, thanks, Ken. Thank you. I'm glad that you're purchasing, that you're doing this. So uh, can we move 20, resolution 25, a resolution of the Longmont City Council? This is for the purchase of the real property for preservation of agricultural land surrounding Union Reservoir. Do I have a motion to move that? Oh, we already I had moved that. Yeah. So all those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed, thank you. That passes unanimously. The second resolution is R26, a resolution of the Longmont City Council authorizing a short-term lease agreement between the city of Longmont and Christopher Kelleher, who is the tenant on the Kelleher property uh, premises. Um, do I have a motion? So moved. Okay, that's been moved by Mayor Pro Tem and seconded by Councillor Yarbrough. All those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed, thank you. That passes unanimously. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. So now we go to the 2022 legislative bills recommended for city council position. Uh, Sandy Cedar, there you are. Mayor Peck and members of council, Sandy Cedar, assistant city manager. Um, I only have one bill for you today. And this was actually brought by um, a resident group that's interested in you supporting this. CML's also supported this. This is the uh, People and Pollinators Bill. So this is Senate Bill 22-131 concerning measures to improve pollinator habits for the protection of the environment. What this bill does is it makes a number of changes to our state law to be able to protect the health of pollinators and pesticide use. Uh, what I found when we uh, conferred with our public works and natural resources partners is that many of the practices in this bill are already done by our parks and forestry folks. Um, and what this bill actually would do is increase municipal control um, around pesticide use outside of this. Now, one of the questions that I have gotten is whether this would allow then the council to be able to pass ordinances, should this pass, um, that would help to regulate other areas like HOA parks and other things. And depending on how the ordinance would be written, then that would be a true statement. That that is something that you'd be able to have additional local control about because currently there's a preemption on that. So this bill not only puts into uh, practice some new protections, but also opens up municipal control to be able to provide even, even more oversight uh, from a municipality. So because of that, and because it does um, support the council's work plan with respect to maintaining the balance between the built and natural environment, staff recommends council support, Senate Bill 22-131. Great, do I have a motion to support this bill? Uh, Councillor Hidalgo Ferry. <laughs> I think I read your lips. All right. Can I have a second? <laughs> okay, Councillor Waters. So it's been moved by uh, Councillor Hidalgo Ferry, seconded by Councillor Waters. All those in favor, raise your hand. All those opposed. This is going to make Ingrid Moore very happy. <laughs> Thank you. So now we are at the final call, public invited to be heard. It's time to call in now for final public uh, comment. The information is on the screen again. The, 
The number to call in is 1-888-788-0099. Please mute the live stream and dial in now. We're going to take a five-minute break to give everyone time to get started, to get dialed in.
Mayor Peck, we're approaching the five minute mark. Currently, there are no callers. Okay, thank you, Dallas. Um, we will move on then. Sounds good. So since we have no callers, there will be no public invited to be heard tonight. Uh, we're gonna have Mayor and Council comments. Anybody wanna make a comment? Nothing to say. I will make a comment. Um, I wanted to say per the uh, our executive session, one thing that was mentioned in there is um, transit. And I just wanna say that Councilwoman Martin and I are working on uh, intra-city transit, shuttle and other services. We're, we're on the, the committee that is exploring that and it's very exciting. So uh, our meeting is gonna be March 2nd. So we'll look forward to that. Harold, do you uh, have any comments from the city manager? No comments, Mayor Council. Thank you, Eugene. No comments, Mayor. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, it looks like we're ready to adjourn. Can I have a motion to adjourn? I'm uh, Councillor Hidalgo Ferry. I move to adjourn. <laughs> Thank you. I'll second that. All those in favor, raise your hand. Good night, everyone.